I'd like to call to order the uh, meeting of the King George County School Board. In just a moment, you stand for the invocation, which will be led by Pastor Davis from Tabernacle Baptist Church. Remain standing for the pledge and a moment of silence. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we do bow uh, tonight in thanksgiving. Lord, thanking you for the privilege of being an American. Lord, and we uh, pray for the school board, for Kathy uh, Hoover, Lord, and for Ed Frank, and for David Bush, Colleen Davis, and uh, Matthew uh, Rolls, and Lord, for the student representatives, Lord, we pray for them, and our superintendent, Dr. Boyd, and Lord, uh, these are on our um, prayer list at church. Every Wednesday night, we pray for these leaders in, in our schools, and Lord, we pray for every principal in every school in, in this county uh, each week. And so, Lord, as we lift them up, Lord, as they are having a very important job, uh, we ask you, Lord, to give them wisdom and understanding on what to do and uh, how to lead. And, Lord, the Bible says to train up a child the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart therefrom. So, Lord, help us to train up a child in the way they should go. And so, Father, we'll thank you and praise you. Lord, I wish we go into this meeting tonight. We pray you lead God and direct, and may things be done decently and in order, things that be pleasing to thee. May what's accomplished glorify you. And, Lord, we thank you for this week, the Easter week, Lord, where Christ was crucified, resurrected from the grave, and is alive forevermore. Thank you, dear Lord. We ask it all in the wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. We have the Pledge of Allegiance led by King George High School. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank 
you. So wait a minute, don't leave yet. Okay, high schoolers, who are you? Just random or are you from specific entities? <laughs> One of you get up and tell us. I'm from King George FFA. My name is Addison Rollins and I'm the vice president. Thank you. I am Lieutenant Commander Savannah Nelson. I'm the commanding officer of our school's NJROTC program. Wonderful. My name is Deborah Fairfax. I'm the president of our school's future health professional. My name is Zoe Helker. I'm from HOSA. I'm the reporter. My name is Tyler Truslow. I'm the co-VP for DECA of Finance. My name's Salma Amrani. I'm from Skills USA. My name's Catherine Band, and I'm co-president of Skills USA. Good afternoon. I'm Jazzy Suya, and I'm the president of FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America. Hello, my name is Ethan Damon, and I'm here from Skills USA. And I'm Jenna Wines. And I'm Ava Kreveling, and we're co presidents of DECA. Wow, wonderful. I think it's the first time we've had representatives from so many different um, clubs and agencies and groups. So, so thank you and God bless you for being here. All right. Um, the first thing we have is a recognition on the PTA County um, Council uh, reflection winners. We have so many winners here. I may just leave these in the box, forgive me. Good evening, Chairman Bush, uh, Dr. Boyd, and all of our fellow um, school board members and student representatives. My name is Terry Rinko, and I am the proud president of the King George County Council of PTAs. I'm here before you this evening to recognize our County Council PTA Reflections winners. Reflections is an annual arts contest sponsored by our Parent Teacher Association. And um, this year's theme was, I am hopeful because. At this time, I would like to call to the podium several of our winners who placed at their, at their building level and moved up for consideration at the county council level. At this time, I'd like to recognize first place winner in primary visual arts, Evelyn Samaru from Potomac Elementary. Congratulations. And come on up front. Come on up front. Second place winner for primary visual arts, Edmund Niami from Sealston Elementary. Congratulations. Come on this way, hun. Come on up to the front. Third place from Sealston Elementary, Neolan Hayes Castefalo Alfaro. <laughs> Moving on to primary photography. First place from King George Elementary School, we have Conley Lewis. And second place in that same category from Sealston Elementary, Lily Ann Green. Moving on to dance choreography from King George Elementary School, first place winner, Nora Karsten. And moving on to intermediate visual arts, we have from King George Elementary, first place winner at the County Council level, level Bryn Lewis. Thank you. 
Second place, Owen Fitzgerald from Potomac Elementary. And third place from Sealston Elementary, Luca Davis. You're welcome. In the inter intermediate photography category, first place from Sealston Elementary, Samuel Niemi. In our special artist photography category from King George Elementary School, Dylan Lamb. You're welcome. Moving on to middle visual arts. We have first place winner from King George Middle School, Ellie Niemi. In middle school literature, first place from King George Middle School, Kayla Hosey. Congratulations, yes. King George Middle School Middle Photography, we have Wyatt Lamb, first place winner. In middle, middle school film production, first place winner from King George Middle School, Kayla Posey. And moving on to middle school dance choreography, we have first place winner from King George Middle School, Katherine Nestor. All right. In middle school music composition, we have first place winner from King George Middle School, Faith Weber. <laughs> Moving on to the high school level. From King George High School in high school literature, first place winner, Vivian Rinko. And at the high school level, in the category of photography, beautiful photography, we have first place winner, Tyler Treslow. Congratulations to all of our county council winners. Um, we're gonna make sure we take a picture and also share with the board that we actually had two of our winners place at the state level. Um, we got those results. We have, as honorable mention in the special artist photography se uh, section, Dylan Lamb. So let's give it up for Dylan. And at the high school literature level with an award of merit for her literature piece, Vivian Rinko. And I right, wait before you leave. Can you, I, we didn't see the picture? Can you just stand out a little bit and turn around so you step, take a couple steps forward, just turn around so we can see the pictures. <laughs> wow, that is so cool! Yeah, turn your picture. Oh, it's okay. Oh, that's still a picture. Yeah, wow, very good. Good work. Good work. Well done. Well done.
obviously some of you didn't have pictures, but still we wanted to see them. Thank you so much. Go back to your seats. Thank you. We'll give some of the parents time to leave. <laughs> Feel free to stay or leave with your children, whichever you choose. <laughs> While we're waiting, do we have public comment, Dr. Boyd? Yeah. Okay, we have one public comment um, from uh, Pastor Sherman Davis. If you'd like to come forward, come to the mic there. And um, Pastor Davis, you'll have three minutes. If you don't right. mind. I'd like to read from you to you tonight from the first Timothy chapter number two, verses one through six. Scripture says, Exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayer, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made to, for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the Spirit of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For therefore is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be a testimony in due time, or to testify in due time. I'm just here tonight to thank the board for the, I believe the good job they're doing. And um, we pray for you, like I said earlier, regularly. I'm here to, of course, to read from the Word of God and to be a blessing uh, to the school board and to those who are present, but to let others know that uh, the separation of church and state doesn't mean that God's been kicked out of the courthouse, the schoolhouse, or the White House. That separation of church and state certainly doesn't mean that we can't that the Christians lose their citizenship or right to, to the First Amendment. And so there's been some confusion in that area as I've been in the past that people think that that's what it means. And of course, the separation of church and state simply means that the uh, state keeps its nose out of the church's business. We don't have any uh, state churches. This is not England or Germany or Japan or anywhere else. There's no state churches. And uh, that just simply means that uh, we are uh, under our own, uh, there's no state rule in the church. And so we appreciate the opportunity to read from the scriptures. It's not against the law or a violation of the, script, of the, of the scriptures, of the, of the state or the law or the constitution. Just a wonderful privilege to be able to read. And anybody has this privilege, I'm trying to encourage other preachers, other pastors to come and uh, to be able to read and start the meeting off with the word of God. What better way to start a meeting out than in prayer and of course with the word infallible, inspired, and errant word of God. God bless you and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Davis. Appreciate it. All right. Um, any changes to the agenda? Mr. Rolls? Yes, Mr. Chair. I understand we need to pass the uh, updated health care premiums tonight. So I ask that, that be added as an action item. Okay, you don't want to cover that with the budget update? You'd rather cover it separately? Yeah, I think those are two very big topics that we've always treated separately, which I think is the wise way to do that. Okay, we can do that. The problem, um, Mr. Rolls, is that the, the budget approval is the action item, and if we have a separate discussion, that'd be a discussion item. So well, that's the only issue with that. It has to be an action because we, we have to decide today. I right, that was my point. So you want to make that an action item? Yes, I said, yes. Okay. Would you like to have that then before um, Dr. Boyd gives his um, presentation about the budget update, you think? Yes, that makes sense. All right, board members, any uh, issue with that or a problem? I don't have a problem. That's fine with me. Okay. All right, Dr. Boyd, then just before you give your budget approval, then we will have a discussion about the um, the insurance, okay? Yes, sir. 
It's the health insurance, obviously. All right, any other changes to the agenda? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair, if we could add an information item, preschool update. Okay, any problem board members, you all right with that? All right, then under information items, you have committee reports and then B will be preschool update under information items. All right, any other changes to the agenda? All right, um, we're gonna move on to the uh, presentations, the CTE Advisory Committee. We have some gifts for you first before we get started. So um, we wanted to go ahead and distribute those for you. It's Tyler. Are these different plants or all tomato plants? Um, love will be for. Well, thank you, sir. So you have several little goodies there for you. So there is a live plant. Well, they're all live plants. The live plant came from the greenhouse at King George High School. Um, and okay. the students oh, the, the uh, planted that thing. for you. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell, can we give the last one to Dr. Wright, please? Um, so the students planted that for you. And then the little yellow uh planner there that you received was actually 3D plant printed in Kathy Crop's classroom. And it does have a seed in it. And there's a little tag there that tells you what you're growing. And then inside your bag, you have lots of goodies as well that are related to CTE. So we just wanted to let you know what you're having. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Boyd, Mr. Chairman, school board members and student representatives. My name is Kim Cheslow. I am one of the assistant principals at King George High School, and I have the privilege of being able to also supervise our career and technical education programs. Thank you for allowing us this time tonight to celebrate career and technical education and the wonderful things that we do and that we're currently doing to grow our programs for King George County Schools. Thank you to all of our students for being here this evening, for doing the Pledge of Allegiance and for gathering all the goodies that you received. We appreciate all your hard work and the community service and representing CTE at all of the organizations across the state and national events that you all participate in. We know that you give a lot of your time in the classroom and outside of the classroom to participate in all of those events. And we are all very, very proud of each and every one of you. Congratulations on your accomplishments thus far, and we look forward to celebrating even more as we move into state and national competitions that are also coming up. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our amazing CTE teachers who make CTE possible for our students in this county. Teachers at King George Middle School, teachers, if you could come up, please, when I call your name, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, Mrs. Elizabeth Mich Michelet, Mr. Matthew Smith, Mrs. Brandy Thomas and Mrs. Jennifer Watson are from the middle school. Thank you. All right, from the high school, I have Mr. A.J. Addison, Mrs. Raymond, Miss, I'm sorry, Mr. Raymond Blazer, Major <laughs> Grant Callahan, Mrs. Orr Crawley, Mrs. Kathy Crop. Master Sergeant Jeff Helker, Mrs. Kim Jarrell, Dr. Nicole Lowe, Mrs. Lisa Mohammed, Mr. Stan Mitchell, Mr. Ralph Stefani, Mrs. Amanda Stepp, Mrs. D. Strauss, Mrs. Lisa Tate, 
Mrs. Amber Wise, and Mr. David Vogel. Thank you all very, very much, and thank you for everything that you do daily for our students and for our school and community. I also have the privilege of working daily with Mrs. Terry Rinko, who is our new work-based learning specialist, and also with Mrs. Christine Hill, who is the supervisor of secondary instruction and related services, which includes CTE. And we couldn't do, I couldn't do my job and our teachers couldn't do it without these two ladies that support us tremendously. Thank you for letting me go through all of those teachers' names. I feel that it's very important to recognize the hard work of our educators in the community and everything that these CTE teachers do, a lot of which happens after school and on the weekends, and I greatly appreciate the time that they put into that. Um, all right, so let's talk about CTE a little bit. So career and technical education provides students and adults with um, the academic and technical skills that they need to go out into the workforce um, to obtain um, careers. CTE programs have been organized in 17 career clusters um, and sig similar occupational groups, which we all follow that pathway to make sure that we serve our students. A career pathway represents the common set of skills and knowledge that students need for their full range of career opportunities that they will have to, whether it be at entry level management, um, technical and also professional careers. 39 career pathways are um, offered here in King George County Schools. We have 119 sections of classes that are given to our students daily. And currently there are 2,103 students who are in a CTE course, either at King George High School or King George Middle School. A CTE completer, um, so our CTE students are allowed the, are given the opportunity to earn a credential as well as be a completer as they make their way through their high school curriculum in CTE. A CTE completer is a student who's met all the requirements of a concentrated sequence um, as well as the requirements for high school graduation. Um, students also have the ability to take CTE uh, credentials um, we had, last year we had 146 student completers, 667 credentials were received, um, and those are the tests that the students take to show that they have the understanding of the curriculum. Those are business curriculum CTE uh, credentials, so they can put them on their resume, and it allows them to make themselves more um, uh, user-friendly when they go out to get a job. Um, 19 of those credentials out of the 667 were state licensures through our CNA program. Um, so our students, those 19 students walked out of King George High School with a state license to practice as CNA students in, in the state of Virginia. Industry certification exams that are available through CTE, I've listed those here for you. They're a variety from the ASVAB to the WISE literacy certification that all of our economics and personal finance students take. Um, in addition to, for example, the MAUS certification through Microsoft Office, um, our students are um, given the opportunity to take those. But as you can see, there's a tremendous amount all the way through all of our CTE programs that are available. We um, also offer currently 61 electives in all of our programs of studies that is included at the high school and at the middle school. So students have the ability to take 61 different types of electives through CTE. All right, so a little bit later in our presentation, you will be able to see um, our CTSO, Student Career and Technical Student Organizations. You'll hear from our students but those are the um, seven organizations that we offer our students here in King George County Schools. All right, at this time I'm going to, and I wanted to point out in your bags that you received, you received this pamphlet. This pamphlet also gives you information about the CTE programs and the CTSO organizations. Um, but at this time, Mrs. Hill is going to talk to you about the new items that we have added recently to CTE. Hi, good evening. 
thank you for allowing me to share some of these wonderful things that are happening in our CTE program. So um, we have included an entrepreneurship course at King George High School, and uh, it was a longtime dream of one of our teachers to have this course. Uh, Ms. Strauss will be teaching this course and is teaching this course. Um, this was really uh, supported by a grant opportunity that we had with uh, Virginia, or uh, with Go Virginia grant, and we partnered with the county um, and the uh, Economic Development Office um, under uh, Nick Miner. And with that partnership, we were able to uh, bring in special uh, professional development, special uh, student opportunities, uh, that centered around entrepreneurship. So it was a great partnership and, um, and they um, supported us uh, through that uh, partnership. Another thing that we've done uh, this past year is career investigations. We have this new course at King George Middle School and Brandy Thomas, our middle school teacher who, who is here, right here, um, has done a fabulous job with this. Uh, this sort of also came out of a, a, a Go Virginia grant out of Stafford County, where they partnered with the Jason Project to build a curriculum, uh, and then they made that curriculum free to any of the uh, surrounding uh, school systems. And with that course, um, we were able to have a, 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 I guess, a supplemental piece to the course that Brandy has developed at the school. Not every uh, student takes that course, um, but it is something that we would like to happen. There are only so many hours in the day and many of our students um, want to do everything. And so we do miss some of our students, but um, we have, uh, I would say, at least a quarter of our students in eighth grade taking that course. So it's a, it's a great program. Um, CTE programs uh, were, added to STEAM night. So at STEAM night, we figured we need to get the word out that these uh, classrooms exist, that these programs exist, and especially to our, our uh, parents of our youngest learners. And so um, since we knew we would have them there at STEAM night, it's, it's sort of a, a grand tradition in the county now for um, our elementary students to come up to the high school for that program. We wanted to open up our labs and open up our classrooms to share what is happening in our career and technical education programs as well. So I really appreciate it because it's a long day and our teachers uh, stay and um, have activities for students and, and um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. In addition, we have increased the availability of our criminal justice program. Um, we have an instructor, Lisa Muhammad, who uh, is on fire. She's on fire for criminal justice, and um, she took her students to a, uh, a Skills USA tournament where um, she had two students place, and that was uh, in Prince William County. And so um, we're very excited about that. Uh, she's very excited about that, and um, I only see that program uh, growing and growing. In addition, um, we have CTE Explores Professional Development, and this is, um, uh, I don't know exactly where the brainchild came from, but it could be somewhere over there. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the <laughs> where we're trying to get all of the teachers in the building also to be aware of what is happening in the building. So often as teachers, we're, you know, we're in our classroom and we're in our content and we forget that there are things happening in the building. And what is the CTE anyway? So um, there was a professional development opportunity for teachers on their work day to um, take a, a tour of our CTE classrooms. And it was, it was optional, but many teachers did participate. So that was a, a great thing. Um, we're always looking for ways to inform and to in communicate with all of our stakeholders so that they're aware of these great opportunities for, for our students. Um, we also held a reverse career fair, and I really um, should not be the one up here speaking to that because, um, uh, again, somebody here... Um, <laughs> learned about a, a reverse career fair and then made it happen. And so she got the buy-in from the teachers um, that participated um, and it 
and it will now stay with our with our schools. It's a great thing. And so instead of having students kind of pop around to table to table to table um, in a career fair where they might pick up a pamphlet or you know a bracelet or a freebie or something and kind of learn about what is out there for jobs, we all know that the jobs that possibly our ninth graders um, learn about may not even exist or may be totally different by the time they graduate. So. What we really need to instill in our students is a way to present themselves, a way to talk about their passion and what they see for the future. And by bringing in the employers to learn about the students and what they want, um, it's a win-win. So we were really excited about that program as well. And then uh, the KG Career Academy, again, um, a, a vision um, that we have in King George County, um, which will be supported by um, uh, something else that Ms. Rinko will talk about, the Career Z Challenge, which we have also talked with you about before. Um, so the KG uh, Career Academy, and we're still work, excuse me, working and developing this, but there are a lot of great things that are happening around the country with career and technical education. And we've really branched out beyond our region to learn, to learn about what other school divisions are doing, especially small school divisions where they are making things happen. And so we're just trying to get, get that, um, uh, that kind of um, empowerment from other divisions who have already done there. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, we have had some service learning uh, opportunities just recently, last week, um, Mr. Mitchell and some of our science teachers took students out to the uh, Farleyvale farm and they planted trees. And there was a large group of students that learned uh, about watershed and about planting and about what uh, the seedlings needed. And so they went out there with um, the Friends of the Rappahannock and we're in a grant with them as well. And they're working mostly with our science department, but what's beautiful is that they included some of our other teachers like Mr. Mitchell. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, teachers um, are growing opportunities constantly in their classroom by partnering with our community and by um, finding opportunities for students to enrich their curriculum. Um, and it, it, as you can see tonight, um, we have excellent teachers in career and technical education, and we're so excited to have them. Uh, and to be a part, I'm, I feel honored to be a part of career and technical education in King George. So um, our next uh, speaker will be uh, Ms. Rinko and she's gonna talk about work-based learning. Good evening again all. At this time, if I may, I would love to welcome to the podium with me um, some of our student engagement team who happen to be here. They're very active in their CTSOs, and I see them in the crowd. And so if I may, if I can have you join me, if you're a part of our new work-based learning student engagement team, come on up front. I wanted to start um, my part of the presentation about work-based learning um, having these amazing students here with me. Actually, come, let me have you guys come to the side so you're not behind me because you really, you really have helped us to create the synergy that we have going on in this building. And we couldn't do it without you. And so I wanna make sure that you see these, these faces. Um, we have uh, these students before you were a part of a focus group of students who helped us to brand work-based learning in our school um, so that it was friendly and, uh, and, and attractive and understandable to our students in King George High School. And they came up with, for work-based learning, instead of work-based learning or WBL, the more academic term, they came up with the pilot. And the pilot pr program um, has to do with the fact that the second semester here, we are finally at a position where we are about ready to roll out a smattering of work-based learning opportunities, much like a pilot, and we used that term and these students grabbed that term and said, what better than when you hear about a pilot, for instance, with Netflix, you know that that's the beginning of an exciting new series. And they wanted to use that term. And um, so we, we all voted, they said, yes, we'll go with the pilot. We came up with a uh, brand and um, I won't, I'm gonna put it right here on the spot, but Jenna Wines came up with the acronym for pilot, pairing interest with local opportunities for training. And doesn't that say it all for what work-based learning is? These wonderful students have helped us to 
um, gather student interest surveys during their lunch hours. And we currently have over 170 students who have signed up to be considered for that smattering of first work-based learning experiences at King George High School. So let's give it up for our pilot program engagement team. And the Rotary Club helped to outfit the team with these lovely t-shirts that have all the different work-based learning opportunities down the runway and the acronym on the back. So I wanted to make sure you had a chance to see that. So this time you guys may be seated. But thank you guys so much. We couldn't do it without you and, and your enthusiasm for this program. Secondly, I wanted to mention to you, we do have 60 new industry partners that have come on board since the beginning of the school year, and they represent all different facets of the community. We could not be prouder, and more industry partners are coming on board. Um, new industry partners are brought to our CT Eats. CT Eats is our casual dinner meeting series that we hold about once a month. The next one is on April 9th, Tuesday, April 9th. So we look forward to um, giving you information about, about that. We'd love for you to come out and join us. Collaboration happens at that dinner table and um, our industry partners bring other industry partners. They bring people who aren't sure that we have CTE. They bring people who didn't know we had vocational education anymore. They bring people who are excited. How can they contribute to what is forming in King George County schools? They are excited about the synergy that's going on. Thirdly, I wanted to mention to you, um, sorry, fourth, uh, Corecraft. We have a uh, partner, Ger Germana has come into our building and they are offering our uh, first, our first in King George High School, a community college entry level um, skills course. It's after hours, three to 5 p.m. It is the first time Germana has been in a public high school in seven years. And our group, our cohort is the largest group they've ever had in a high school, 14 students. We exceeded our goal of 10. Um, these students are there every day. They came the first day, which was the first day after our spring break on a Monday. After spring break, I thought that that could be bad, but all 14 were there. They were just itching and ready to go. So we're very excited about our community uh, partnership with Germana, and we look forward to growing that as well. Last, not last, fifth. We have also our first industry co-op student, who couldn't be with us this evening, Sebastian Chu. And he works as a detailer for half of his day. He spends half of his day at King George High School completing his um, drafting and his uh, last of his graduation requirements the first half of the day. And the second half of the day, he is busy in CMC Rebar in the uh, Industrial Park in King George. And he is learning hands-on from other detailers. We had a um, meeting between Rappahannock Community College CMC and King George County Schools to, again, come around a table and talk about how can we better prepare our students so we have more Sebastians uh, at CMC Rebar. And we had that conversation about what we can do to better prepare our students from King George High School to fill those slots that are available at CMC. Lastly, I wanted to share with you, we are in the final home stretch of the Career Z Challenge, which is a Department of Education, for better lack of a better term, grant contest. As you know, we're in the semifinals this school year. We are one of 81 out of the whole country. 81 schools nationwide will receive $10,000 at the end of this semester, at the end of this uh, school year, and we are in the run-in to be in the top 10. They will choose 10 from all of those who have created a dream, succeeded in creating their dream work-based learning ecosystems, helping to create collaboration and culture and synergy within their communities, within their schools, and within their parents and in their households to give our students the workplace readiness skills that they need to succeed when they leave our high school. We believe we are doing that, and we know that we're gonna be in that top 10. And when we do, it's gonna be exciting because $150,000 is gonna be infused into our programs. And we cannot wait to show you what we can do with what we have and where we're going. And so with that, Again, thank you for your support of King George County Schools, King George High School, work-based learning, and all that we do here with King George High School CTE. Thank you. There's some pictures um, in your slide that you had there. Um, that picture up on the top left is one of our um, CTE Eats meetings um, that we held. Um, down at the bottom is where um, Sebastian signed his letter of intent, kind of like an athlete does to go play with, to go play sports. 
he signed his letter of intent to go work. So that's amazing. Um, so there are some of those pictures there. And then if I could have my two DECA officers come up and share with you quickly what's going on with DECA. Good evening. My name is Ava Kreveling, and I'm one of the co presidents of King George DECA. Um, our chapter is very competitive. We started at the district level in November with 53 competitors at the Spotsylvania Town Center. From there, we took 42 competitors to Vir the Virginia State Leadership Conference earlier this month, month in Virginia Beach, and you can see some pictures up there. Um, our chapter received recognition as the largest chapter in Region 3, earned the top blue chip award for annual report, and was named a platinum chapter because of our community service, promotional and membership campaign campaigns, and earned a gold certification for our school-based enterprise Fox Stocks school store. And Virginia Yergi was elected to the Virginia DECA State Officer Team 80 as Vice President of Region 3. Um, we're taking nine students next month to the International Career Development Conference in Anaheim, California. Isla Zook will be, compete in food marketing series. Alexis Burke will compete in the professional selling event. Noah Miller and Carson Dees will present our gold certified SBE Fox stocks. Virginia Yergi will be a voting delegate with team 79 and team 80. And Grace Zook, Kaya Wilson, Lanique Morgan, and Skylar Winfrey will be attending the Thrive Academy. We are very excited for these students and invite you all to support them on their trip. Cash and checks are welcome. Thank you in <laughs> advance for supporting our chapter. <laughs> and I am Jenna Wines. I am another co-president of King George DECA. Our chapter currently has 206 members this year, including 161 student members, 21 professional members, 22 alumni members, and two dedicated advisors. To continue to engage Engage our student members, we have food and fun at our monthly meetings, like the Oreo challenge and raffles for great prizes. We also have two upcoming field trips, the, Fre the Fredericksburg Nationals game next month and DECA Day at King's Dominion in May. We also engaged in community service activities last fall. We volunteered at the King George Festival, held our annual Veterans Day 5K and one mile fun run to raise money for the Some Gave All Foundation, held a volleyball tournament to raise money for the King George High School volleyball teams, held a dodgeball tournament to raise money, to raise money for Ainsley's Angels, and sponsored families in need at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Coming up this spring, we have two fundraisers, fundraisers underway, and we are looking forward to, to many of our members participating in the Special Olympics Feet Meet on April 10th, and are encouraging students to sign up for any of the marketing classes, including, including entrepreneurship for next year, so that they will be able to join King George DECA. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, ever good afternoon everyone. I'm uh, Jazzy Suyat, and I'm the president of uh, Future Business Leaders of America at King George High School. Um, and this year has been an amazing year with several successful community projects, including a shoe fundraiser and participation in the Angel Tree Program. And um, recently, February 29th, we had the FBLA Germana Regional Conference and Competition, and it was held, uh, and 12 FBLA members from King George High School competed in 16 different categories. And although in the previous years we've had a small number of amount of members participate. Uh, this year, we were able to bring home five medals, two second place medals, and uh, three third place medals. Um, and FBLA will continue to compete on April 12th to 13th at the state conference and competition in Reston VA. And uh, we just ask you to wish us luck. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Tate. I'm just going to sneak in with Deb because I want to recognize some of my nurse aid students. Um, nurse aid is automatically part of our HOSA group. Um, we've had uh, Zalia Almanar Lopez, who was able to participate in the 2024 Rappahannock Regional Jail Correctional Health Externship, the very first one. So of all those that um, competed for that position, there was only one position, Zalia received it. She spent her spring break at Rappahannock Regional Jail in their clinic and worked from nine to five, Monday through Friday. 
came home excited. She could not wait to tell all the students about the wonderful people that she took care of. Wow. Very proud of her. Um, we then have Zoe Helper, who is actively participating in the emergency preparedness program at Rappahannock EMS Council. And that's been a semester long, monthly, nightly meetings that she's been going to get uh, Rappahannock area ready for emergencies. And then I have three students who are competing to volunteer at Mary Washington Hospital this summer. Um, in our Rappahannock region, 150 people have gone through interviews and who are gone through um, processes of saying why they would be good volunteers and only 20 will be chosen. So we will find out in three weeks. I just wanted to speak to them. Hi, everybody. My name is Deborah Fairfax. I'm the president of our school's HOSA chapter. Um, I just wanted to speak on some of the activities that we've been participating in this semester. So we started off in February. Um, we held a Valentine's fundraiser where we sold tulips to our students. Um, we were able to raise about $800, and we got all of those tulips that we sold donated from our local um, Blumia dispensary. So we definitely would like to thank them. Um, from there, we went and hosted a prom for our residents at Heritage Hall. We wanted to get them up and excited about something. Um, so we did a little, we called it the Heritage Hall Ball. Um, we had some of our CNA students go over and help the staff get them dressed. We also had some HOSA students helping with hair and makeup and getting, um, we had some donators from the community who made corsages for all of our residents. That way they could have something they could keep. Um, and we also had TC Nelson, a local photographer, donate his time, so we'd love to thank him. Um, we also, this past, I think it was last week, took a trip to the uh, Rappahannock EMS Council building to um, learn some of our ways to handle certain things. So first, we learned how to handle anaphylactic shock on a child um, and the subsequent 911 call. We also learned uh, how the, our EMS will han handle uh, car accidents. So, And we did went through a simulation where a man was ejected from his car. We also learned that he had overdosed, and we learned how EMS would go about um, handling that situation. We also learned about something called an anatomage table. It's basically a big iPad, as they called it, um, where people who donate their bodies to science will get chopped up and their um, <laughs> systems will be kind of on the table. So you can press, you can select like the nervous system and see all of their nerves throughout their body, how it interacts. And so that's definitely a very interesting thing that um, we didn't really know existed, but it's a great learning opportunity. Um, and then finally, we're trying to put together a field trip to go to the DEA Museum in Arlington um, so that our students can learn about the current opioid crisis. And we are uh, very gratefully accepting donations for a charter bus. <laughs> um, thank you for your time. Good evening, my name is Addison Rollins and I'm the Vice President of King George FFA. This year, some of our competitions we have competed in have been tractor troubleshooting and garden tractor and tractor driving. At State Fair, we competed in the tire art competition, forestry field day, agri-science poster, and ag demo. Some community, service we, some community service projects we've done this year are the garden club plant sale, the Farm Bureau annual crab feast, steam night, and planting trees at the Farley Vale Farm with Friends of the Rappahannock. Some of our upcoming events are our state convention in June, volunteering at the Special Olympics Feet Meet, the Fredericksburg Area Show and Sale, a plant sale, and selling at the Farmer's Market. Thank you.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Savannah Nelson, the commanding officer of our Fox Company. Fox Company is continuing to do great things. Right now, we are consistently um, serving our time and volunteering at our local food pantry, Love Thy Neighbor, with our annual military ball coming up on April 6th, which we are all very excited for. Following that, at the end of April, we have a field trip coming up where our seniors and our juniors will be going to West Virginia. We are hoping hoping that our cadets will gain good experiences from this and create bonds that they can bring back to our unit and learn some things throughout the experience. We also have our Cadet Appreciation Day and our award ceremony following this at the end of the year. And this is a way for us to recognize and honor some of our cadets in our program who are doing great things and should be recognized for all that. Thank you for your time this evening. We appreciate the opportunity to be here. Hello, I'm Catherine Bannon. I'm co-president of Skills USA. Um, earlier this year, we had our annual car show fundraiser at the Fall Festival, and we also participated in our Thanksgiving and Christmas baskets for our community service. We donate those to families in need around the holidays. Um, earlier in the year, we had students come to compete at our district competitions, um, and I competed in architectural drafting, and I got first place and um, we will have students go up to compete in Virginia Beach in April for our state's competitions. Joining the presidential committee office will be an 11-year record. 11-year record? 19-year record. Oh. <laughs> he beat Everett County, and that's a 19-year-old record. He's even strong as an instructor. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ethan Damon. I competed last month at Safford High School in additive manufacturing, which you might know as 3D printing. Uh, my teammate and I were tasked with designing a low-cost 3D printed centrifuge to be powered by a battery-operated drill to be used in low-income communities to be able to do blood diagnostics. We placed second place. We were not as fortunate as Catherine, and we did, in <laughs> fact, lose to Stafford's team. However, we still placed second, and we are continuing on to states next month, and we are currently hard at work preparing for that, and we hope to do just as well, if not better. Hello, my name is Salma Amrani, and my team and I competed in crime scene investigation just recently. So we got to actually evaluate a crime scene. We got to talk to this officer. Um, yeah, other, those aren't pictures of us. No. Okay, well, we got to evaluate this really cool crime scene, got to talk to an officer, got to like put all the evidence away, file the evidence, file the crime scene of report, and then take a test. So it was really fun, and we ended up getting second place. And I will be going to states. Thank you for your time. All right, so um, I would like to mention, uh, Ms. Hill mentioned it earlier, that criminal justice competition that we went to for Skills USA was the first competition that King George High School had competed in. And our teams did place second and third with the second place team being able to advance to state. So that's pretty amazing for our first time. Um, Teachers for Tomorrow is another organization that we have for, um, for an area that we certainly want to um, make sure that we grow, which is our teacher cadet program, where our teachers get, our students get an opportunity to be in the classroom with our wonderful Dr. Lowe. They learn from her and then they go out to our schools and our community to get hours and um, participate in the ability to actually see what a teacher does every single day. So that's an awesome opportunity for our students as well. Um, we would really like to take the opportunity to thank you for your time this evening. We are not lost on the fact of how long it takes to go through all the wonderful things that these teachers and students do daily. Um, and we do value your time and we appreciate the, the time that you allowed us to do that this evening. And thank you for all your support that you give to career and technical education 
um, all throughout the year. We greatly appreciate it, and we're just so proud of what we accomplished, and we look forward to continuing to grow and continuing to offer opportunities for our students. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, Ms. Treslow, Ms. Renko, Ms. Hill. Thank you very much. And students, wonderful, wonderful presentations. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, do I have a motion to um, go into um, closed session? First went to state code section 2.2-3712A of the Code of Virginia. I move that the board convene in a closed meeting to review substitutes, resignations, and retirements as permitted under 2.2-3711A, number one of the Code of Virginia. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. We're in closed session.
<clears throat> All right, do we have a motion to return to open session? I move that the King George County School Board return to open session and certify that pursuant to state code section 2.2-3712D, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements under this chapter and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting by the public body. I second and certify. Can we need to... I certify. Yeah, turn on your mic there, Ed. Thank you. So certify. The board also certifies. So um, uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. We're in open session. All right, uh, an action resulting from the closed section. Do we have a motion to approve the personnel presented? I would like a motion that we approve the personnel presented. I second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Your votes aye. They are approved. All right, next on the agenda. So interesting, now that we move this to the, the middle of the meeting, it's just so different. All right, consent agenda. Um, we have the minutes from January 17th, and then we also, um, the organizational meeting, and then we also have the regular meeting on that same date. Do I have a motion to approve those, or are there any comments about them? Hey, Mr. Chair, I do have a correction for the first one. Okay. And it was just simply that the disclaimer was omitted from those minutes. The reason for that was we went back and looked at the board minutes and we didn't approve the disclaimer, I believe, until after the organizational meeting was with Ms. Bushrod. Let me know if that makes sense. Okay. Well, I mean, I think we, we've already approved them, so I, mean, I think it makes sense to everything that comes before us now just to put it on there. Say that again? Well, this, since it's just been brought to us now, after we've already approved that disclaimer verbiage, I think it'd be good just to add it in there. But, well, if I can ask a question, Mr. Rolls, if, if we didn't approve the disclaimer until the regular meeting, I don't know how we could go backwards. We would put that on every meeting from then on. I just think we put it in every minute to come before us since we approved it. So they didn't come to us yet. So now, now it's here, so we can put it on there. But the disclaimer is not part of the minutes because it wasn't there when we, see what I'm saying is we, we approved it after these meetings. So to go back and add to the minutes, I don't think we can do that. And I, am I correct? We're approving them now. So I don't think we need to go back and take minutes that we already approved and add it, but we haven't approved these yet. So I think it's appropriate to uh, but, but I don't understand them because like we're putting them on the other meeting from the exact same day. So why would there? We're going to put them on all subsequent meetings. Yes. Is that what you're saying? I'm sorry. I don't understand. Well, I mean, just the basic point is that we're approving them now. So if they I think they should be on there for everything. So your point is since we're approving them now, why can't we add that since we hadn't approved them in the past? We hadn't already approved them. So why can't we add that? Right. Because we're already pretty much for the other meeting for that exact same day. Uh, I think that that's still a problem even legally. Dr. Boyd, do you have some input on that? I, I, Cheryl and I were just discussing it and, and we thought it was legally of our best interest if we had not yet approved the disclaimer to not include them in the minutes. We can certainly do what, what is the interest of the board. We can take a motion either way. We can, prove them at, we can approve them as amended this evening or we can approve them as they are. We're, we're certainly willing to do what the board thinks is the best opinion. Uh, comments from the rest of the board. Does everybody understand what Mr. Rolls is uh, proposing? I would like to move that we approve the minutes as presented without the disclaimer since the disclaimer was approved after the, this particular, these minutes. All right, thank you, Ms. Hoover. It will, Ms. Davis, go ahead. I, I'm trying to understand, Matt, like what? Do you want me to explain it? Do you want to again, Matt? But do, do you see the, uh, I don't have the page number, but I know the second meter, second uh, set of minutes from the same day, it has this claim in there that we talked about before, um, saying that, hey, these are done by automated means, there's probably gonna be mistakes, but we went back and made sure all the motions are correct. So that's included in the uh, 
beginning the minutes for the regular meeting, but not for the organizational meeting. And since we're approving them all now, I think it's it's appropriate to put that in there. It's, it's as a caveat for our approval, which we're doing right now. We've already said we're going to do that. How do you feel that Cheryl said in for the base of legal reasons that we should probably wait? That was recommended by our chair or our clerk, right? That we should wait. I, I would, if she has a reason to think it might be legal to wait, I would propose that. But I'm trying to, I don't think that you would try to do anything illegal, so I'm trying to understand your brain. Why you want to? I don't think Mr. Rolls is saying illegal, and I don't think Cheryl is necessarily either. I think it's kind of, it would be safer to wait. I, I have, personally, I think we should not include that because it was decided at one of these meetings. So everything after that, it would have to be there. Mr. Rolls' point is, well, yeah, but we haven't approved it yet, so we can still add it to the current minutes. I'm uncomfortable with that. I, I'm not saying it's against the code, but I'm uncomfortable doing that. And Mr. Roll says that he feels comfortable and we should do that. Ms. Hoover was also a slightly uncomfortable, so I kind of need to hear from you two. Dr. Boyd, what'd you get from Cheryl? She said that. Cheryl recommended that we approve the minutes without the disclaimer in the first meeting. Okay, that's fine with me. Ms. Davis, did you have a, any more comment? Um, okay, um, I think we should probably take a vote on this since it, it is minutes. So all those in favor of, I need a motion that all those, uh, if someone would make the, I'll make the motion. Uh, I make the motion that we approve the minutes as is without adding the disclaimer. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? Verify. So you are, you're making the motion for just the organizational meeting minutes right now? Yes. Okay. Now open for dis more discussion. I know we've already discussed it. But in proper rules of order, it's open for discussion again. Mr. Rolls, did you have any further comment? Um, maybe basically the same thing I already said is that this caveat could apply to any of the one minutes that we did in the past to, um, since we've been using this technology, I don't see the need to go back and add it, but it actually, talk about legality, it makes it clear that we were approving this, but there might be um, mistakes. So I think it's actually legally superior to do that and put that in there and cover ourselves that way. That's part of my concern for adding that. Yeah, you have a good point. All right, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 And individually, if you go down the list, Ms. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Rolls? Nay. Mr. Frank? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. All right, now, get my glasses on. Okay, and that was for, that was for both sets of minutes? Well, I just asked if, if it was, you said it was the first only. That was for the first set of minutes. I really didn't make it for the second. I, I can make it for the second. Pardon? So I move that we approve the minutes for the January 17th regular meeting. Seconded by somebody? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Both sets of minutes are approved. All right, action items. Uh, Mr. Roll suggested that we have this discussion about health insurance that we did discuss during our work session on March the 11th. And so Mr. Rolls, I'll let you begin that. It is listed as an action item since it is part of the budget uh, approval process. So I'll let Mr. Rolls, and we'll have this discussion first and then afterwards, Dr. Boyd will present the rest of the budget. Mr. Rolls. Okay, so I don't know, I think it's fairly clear how everyone's gonna vote at this point, but um, so I don't really, not necessarily that I expect to change anybody's mind, but I think it's important to say my piece here because this is a third time talking about healthcare. You know, I remember doing it the first year and just thinking and just be a relaxed conversation about healthcare. It actually got pretty emotional and heated, which really caught me by surprise. So then I realized that this is a, a, a topic that's got to be careful discussing about. It's kind of like, feels like disarming a bomb, bomb sometimes, but that so it shows it's important to people. So it means it's important that we talk about it and carefully consider it, I think. Uh, so ever since then, I thought about how to, how to approach it. So last year, having gone to the VSBA conference and heard a really good presentation about an, an alternative approach that we could take with healthcare. I came here and gave a presentation, talking about that somewhat, and also just talking about some of the economics behind healthcare and trying to make the best use of our dollars. May have been a little bit long for some people's tastes, 
but uh, still, I think it was it was good to communicate. And coming out of that, we did decide that we would try to put together a committee to investigate healthcare options. So that was encouraging that we did that. Um, but then, as fate would have it, I guess we had some things happen with our insurance to where we had the advice that this year, after all, it's not a good year to research or consider different healthcare options. Um, so now we're doing this for the third year, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, make a selection this coming year, look into it, and just trying to decide how to approach it. So I, I don't want to be too long-winded and give a presentation like last year, but you know, I've noticed that in politics, it seems that sound bites can help. Although a sound bite can't really replace um, you know, good economic understanding of the, of the situation, but I thought I might try something here. And to do that, I want you to share a quote from somebody who's much smarter than me. That's uh, Thomas Sowell, somebody I only discovered in 2020. So I'm guessing maybe a lot of people here, people here don't know who that is. So I'll give a quick introduction. He's, he was born relatively poor in Harlem, went to college, became a Marxist there, but then over time realized that that was a flawed way of thinking. And um, has gone on to become one of the most respected living free market economists and sociologists today. And in fact, a um, documentary is available for free about his life. It's only a year long, uh, hour long on YouTube. It's called Thomas Sowell. It's S-O-W-E-L-L, -L, Common Sense in a Senseless World. And it's excellent. I highly recommend it. So with that, his quote is, the first lesson of economics is scarcity. There is never enough of anything to satisfy all those who want it. The first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. So it's a little bit tongue cheek, obviously, but um, and the point I'll see, and it comes from a, a book of essays entitled, Is Reality Optional? And spoiler, reality is not optional. So the yeah, point is that you can't, you know, can't disregard economic reality even if, you know, public reasons, it feels good to do something that feels good at the moment. You know, you also, um, insurance, I mean, I look at that and look at the tables that we had and we see, um, or like one of the options for a family, it's like $700 a month for insurance. And that's just a premium, even if you're perfectly healthy. And that's, that's crushing with pretty much any um, level of income. So, I mean, it's definitely a problem, but, you know, higher level that comes from higher levels than us, but doesn't mean that we shouldn't do what we can to um, deal with the source of the problem. And um, just well, it's easy just to throw money at it, um, you know, papering of the problem with uh, taxpayer dollars without addressing the source. I think is you just you're uh, trading the future for short term, you know, feeling good or you know political gains. So I just caution against that. I mean, it's a problem. I mean, Thomas Sowell says that for a reason. It's, it's a problem throughout. It's a very big temptation. It's, it's hard to get around. And my point with that is if we pretend that healthcare costs aren't going up unacceptably fast, like that they are with 11% this year, um, then that isn't creating the incentive to do something about it. So by just paying it for it, it makes it look like, okay, healthcare didn't go up. But it did, and what we, what we need is not just the five of us up here trying to decide what's best for everybody else. Because we're not nearly as smart as you know the 700 employees out there who know what they want, what they need, and we need them. It's important for them to be us all be on the same boat and working towards a solution to deal with this. And uh, it, you know the reasons for all are complex. A lot of government meddling, and then insurance is the way it's structured. It removes. It's kind of what I presented on last year. Is it? Um, doesn't make you feel like you're spending your own money. So people aren't going to be obviously as careful about finding deals and spending wisely because it's just the insurance company paying for it. And so I'm not saying that just you go figure it out. Uh, I think there are just a lot better options now uh, and, and just really do need uh, help for us to like kind of explore those and pick something better, whether it's the option I saw, you know, last year at the VCA conference, where it's kind of a little bit of a tweak on traditional insurance, where it just gives us more autonomy to make more choices, so that we can make you know better, smarter choices with the um, with the dollars, or more recent things I've become aware of. Like an example is Crowd Health, like where they, um, it's not even traditional uh, insurance, but it's more cost sharing, where it's 
still allows people to pay their doctors more directly and, and deal better and get better deals on the whole. So instead of just thinking about I mean, the troubles, like right now, we can just think year to year, okay, we got this problem, let's, let's just cover it. And then next year we just do the same thing, same thing. And King George, traditionally people serve on this board for just like one, maybe two terms and they're gone. So there isn't really a long-term perspective to say, okay, we've been doing this. We've been kicking the can on the road for a long time and we've got to stop. It just keeps happening. So I think we'd be better served to try to think, you know, 10 years down the road, see, okay, if we keep just hundred percent covering this, you know, this year we're taking, I think one of the, the ones we cover the most, we're paying 83% of the premiums. Once we pay hundred percent this year, if we do that, then it goes up to 85%. And then the next time 87, you know, well, it just keeps going and going. And again, it just removes the incentive to actually solve the problem. I have some examples about my grandmother's medical bill from when my mother was born in 1953, but you know what, we'll skip that. I think it's been long enough. Uh, so, but what I would propose for this time is a way to not go too far. Um, we had that option too, where it's still significantly less than passing the majority of the increase on to um, employees, but just say, okay, we're at the upper end right now, we're covering 83% of the premiums for some employees. Just take all the cost shares that we have and keep them in place. So the school board and taxpayers will pay an 11% increase on the 83% of the premiums for that person that we're already paying for. But then they'll pay an 11% increase on the 17% that they're paying. So everyone sees 11% gain, but obviously the dollar amount for the taxpayers, school board is going to be much higher than the employees. So I think that's a, um, a good compromise just to not keep going in the wrong direction, but still make things easier on employees. So what is your specific um, request or motion in regards to the budget that's going to be presented by Dr. Boyd? I'm going to feedback if I think, but I think it was listed on here when um, Dr. Boyd presented it as option two for the health care. That's actually what we did last year for the first time. Do you mean to explain further what option two is? Just identify, as summarize as best you can, because a couple of us don't have that. I mean, I have it here, but. It just means that the employees what they pay for insurance will go up by 11% and what the school board pays will also go up by 11%. So it's, so then that, that'll mean that the cost share for each individual situation, which varies by plan, will stay the same. So if we're currently paying 83% of the premium, we'll still be paying 83% of the premium. But since the, the overall cost went by 11%, it'll go, go up by 11% for everybody. Who's gonna pay the 11%? Everybody, the taxpayer's portion will go up by 11% and the um, employee's proportion will go up by 11% too. How? So, so for the example I gave of where the school board's paying 83% and like the employee's paying 17%. So, okay, let's look at um, an example here. Also, if that first line for key advantage, 250 with comprehensive dental, I think we're seeing the, I don't know if that's current or the final. Yeah, so I guess the, the presentation here is a little bit. Um, Are you proposing up, option two? Right, so where you see there, since the school board is gonna pay 11% extra on its greater cost share that will amount to the school board paying additional $72.25, whereas increasing the employee's portion by 11%, since theirs is a small portion, their additional cost will only be an additional $12.75. You see the school board's part in dollar in real dollars goes up quite a bit more. Switching these is what he's saying. Okay. That makes sense. So your record... So your recommendation is to this option, this option right here, option two, these two figures right there. For that plan, yeah, and then of course it, he, he does it for all of them. Switch it for the, so the board's paying the 12 and the, yeah, right? No, the board, are, are, for that particular, I mean, there's many different combinations here, but that one particular example, the very first one listed for the employee only, 
uh, for Key Advantage 250. Switch these, then this would be the board. I'm not switching anything. I'm saying it exactly as it's printed for option oh, two so here. Just proposing option two. Right. Okay. So just proposing this option. Dr. Boyd, and I don't want you to go through the whole thing yet, but in terms of insurance only, which option are you going to be proposing just in terms of insurance only? Uh, I'm going to be proposing this evening that the board covers the 11% cost. So basically what Mr. Rolls is suggesting is that that cost is shared and what we have discussed this several times is that we've discussed, you know, compared to the dist or the division paying the full 11% increase. Okay. Mr. Chair, do we have a yes. dollar amount that is equated to what that performs? Yeah, he does. Yes, I do. So originally we were estimating a 20% increase in the first presentation. So in our initial budget presentation, the increase in the, the assumed increase in health care was going to be $857,000, 857525 $857, That was the uh, assumption if it was going to be 20%. The 11% now is 618,557 dollars. And the uh, cost to the school board, if it is shared with the employee, is uh, $466,974. You're talking about the difference of, of about $275,000, somewhere in that ballpark. Which which the employees would have to pay, obviously divided up into all of them, wherever. The employees would have to pay that difference. So, we talked a lot about the offset with the raise and with right, the we did. employees. We see a lot of feedback from many of our teachers and many of our employees about what that difference meant. Uh, so, so we would, yeah, yeah. In, in the budget, present, which we do have to pass a budget. I know, I know we do. The 11% is I respect to Mr. Rolls's um, request and presentation. Um, we need to move forward with this. So, as Dr. Boyd is going to be presenting a budget which will include us paying that 11%. Mr. Rolls is suggesting that that be shared and you heard the dollar difference that he just reported. So do I have a motion in regard to just the insurance portion? I move that we approve option two for the health care insurance. Do I have a second? Mm -hmm. I do not have a second, so the motion fails. All right, I do want to say something, Mr. Rolls. I totally agree with you that I think this year, based on, I'm sorry, what was the name of that organization, Dr. Boyd, I, that recommended that we wait a year? Mark, Mark, thank you. That the organization recommended that we do wait another year before considering changing insurance plans. And uh, he gave all the reasons why, and I think we as a board agreed that those are very good reasons to wait. However, I would, Dr. Boyd, as we're moving forward with this, and Mrs. Zazerski, begin thinking about next year, let's seriously look at um, some other options for health insurance, because I agree with Mr. Rolls about some of the concerns, and we need to be reviewing that as often as we can. I do think it's valuable to wait this year, but next year, let's start looking at some possibilities. And I know you have to start that process in probably October, November, but if we can, let's look at doing that. Well, not now with our relationship with Mark Free, we'll continue to work with them, and they'll continue to, to work in our best interest Good. as far as that's concerned. Outstanding. Thank you. Dr. Ward, What are we using the same insurance company that the county uses? Yes. Okay. And for, I mean, I was at the meeting the other day and the other night, and that seemed to be a good, uh, really respected insurance company that was there. And the county is picking up 11, the whole 11% for the county employees, and it would just be a smack in the face to the teachers if we didn't do that for them also. Yeah, Mr. Frank is right. I spoke with um, several members, and I heard the same thing, that they, the county is paying the 11%. All right, um, Dr. Boyd, please go ahead. So before we move forward, did, did we want to make a motion for the health care? Oh, I'm sorry, we, we did. It, it didn't, we didn't get a second. Do we want to make a motion to approve the board? I'm sorry, you're right. All right, since we're doing the health care, then do I have a motion to approve the 11% to be paid for by the division? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we have, we pay the full 11% by the division. For the health care. Do I have a second? A second. Any further discussion? All right, we'll take an individual vote on this. Ms. Ms. Hoover? Yay or nay? Yay. 
Mr. Rolls? Yay. Mr. Frank? Yes. Ms. Davis? Yes. Chair votes yes, motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you, Dr. Boyd, if you could go ahead. If you could advance to slide nine, we're now taking a look at the 24-25 budget approval this evening. So as we know, it is our responsibility as a school board to present impact budgets for our supervisors. Um, we are required by the Code of Virginia to present that budget to the Board of Supervisors by the end of this month. We have reached out to them. We were originally on the schedule uh, to do that this Wednesday. However, the Board of Supervisors has requested some additional time. So right now we're looking at possibly uh, the first or second week of, of April, according to our, our current, um, I don't know if he's uh, acting county administrator, but he's serving uh, in that role right now. And we're ready and waiting to uh, present the budget to the Board of Supervisors when that opportunity comes. Next slide, nine uh, One, let's see, go oh, one more, two more, right here. Okay, so we'll start, uh, I'll spare you guys. Oh. Thank you, all right. I'm usually pretty loud, but thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so we will we will spare the initial part of the budget presentation that talks about the inputs, the uh, local composite index, enrollment, and a number of other factors that go into budget creation. I just do want to revisit this evening with the board the budget initiatives and how they've uh, adjusted uh, as we've gone through this process uh, with the school board. And also, I want to let you know that just hours not even hours, an hour before I, uh, we arrived here this evening, we did receive the budget calc tool. Uh, Ms. Sherry Williams, our finance uh, uh, um, director, has worked diligently all day long and really crunching a number of numbers. You'll see a lot of updates in this presentation. So I I'm happy to tell you that tonight we're not only going to have a good grasp on expenditures, uh, but we'll have a very good grasp on revenue as well. So I'll be able to pretty much tell you a, a, a good 90, 99% of, of the budget picture this evening, okay? Barring any uh, feedback we get from the Board of Supervisors moving forward. Also, I'd add the caveat that this, uh, this budget presentation is based off the budget that has been approved by the General Assembly. Uh, from the state level, the governor still has an opportunity to uh, review that budget and make any amendments that he would like to make as well, okay? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so you remember our strategic plan uh, goal number one. Uh, this has to do with employee investment and development. And again, what I wanna draw your attention to is the bold-faced uh, initiatives are the ones that are now uh, going to be located in our budget proposal uh, based on some of the in input we received from the General Assembly budget. So again, I'll just start at the top. We first have an increase of salaries by 1%. This was uh, per Governor Yunkin's recommendation. This is 1% and a step for our employees, and the estimate there was uh, just north of a million dollars. Also coming out of the General Assembly budget, just for um, our information, is the General Assembly's budget included a 3% raise for employees, uh, and that the estimated cost of that is $1.5 million. Uh, if you'll notice that that line is not highlighted, I'll show you how we make up that difference later on in, in, these, uh, in this goal. The second uh, goal that we had uh, in this budget cycle is to standardize and modernize curricular and extracurricular stipends. You remembered we increased these by an estimated 25%, and we also standardized them across our secondary and our elementary schools. So we'll have moving forward a much more organized and I think fair rate for uh, those individuals in our school division that do, they go the extra mile and do those extra responsibilities. That's estimated $127,000. Now, uh, the third goal here, this is the one we discussed at our work session. If you remember the two options that we were considering, we're incrementally adjusting our pay scale to adjust the compression. You remember, and for those in the audience, uh, many, many school divisions across the Commonwealth right now has, have compression in their pay scales, meaning if you go back to around 2008, 2012, we had an economic downturn and many school divisions uh, compress their pay scales in order to address that economic downturn. So that compression has worked its way through our scales and it's really making it difficult for teachers uh, that find themselves in steps, really for the teacher scales in steps six through 10. So if you've taught for six years up to, up to year 10, your uh, raise over those four years is only a 0.75%. 
compared to the 2% raise for every other teacher along the scale. The recommendation from the board was to take a look at step 10 and the cost there, and then also take a look at the first step in that compression, which was step six. Uh, I'm happy to present that surprisingly, and, and the way that this was explained to me, I'm happy to present that the compression six is gonna cost a little less than the compression 10. The reason this was explained to me is that we have, a, we have roughly 44 different pay scales. In our teacher scale, uh, most of that compression, uh, it, it does go up higher along step 10 than it would on step six. However, through our other 43 scales, we have a lot of uh, senior employees. Uh, so that makes up the difference for uh, our employees between six and 10, if that makes sense. So long story short and, and very technical finance talk, the cost, the, the step six adjustment is, is slightly less expensive than the step 10 adjustment. I have, a I have a question about that. Considering the next year's budget and the year after, what does that mean? Considering next year's budget and the year after. So uh, many school divisions right now, namely Stafford, Caroline, King William, they're, they're going through a multi-year uh, process where they're adjusting this compression. So ideally, what we'd like to do is if we decide this evening that next year we're going to adjust step six, then next year we come back and depending on affordability, we would adjust step seven and so on until we relieve all of that compression in the scale. Okay. okay. Is, that what, is that what you were? Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to know. So Let's, go ahead. Yes, just ask about that. I mean, I, I would like to see more details on that because I don't see how it's possible because step six, you shouldn't make an increase there. It affects every step above it. So correct. So no matter with different scales, if you go do step 10 instead, you're, you're, you're giving a raise to fewer people, no matter what, how you slice it. So I don't see it's how. confusing. It's confusing me as well. We're actually in the process. And again, this is hot off the press, but we're in the process right now of adjusting those scales. And we, when we have a better, uh, visual of what those 44 different scales look like uh, based on that compression step. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure the board has a copy of it. Okay. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Moving down. Uh, Wait a minute. Yes, sir. But you need a decision as to whether we're going to. No, we need it. We need a decision this evening. And, and step six this or evening, 10. you'll have to make a decision on the fact that uh, I'm letting you know that the cost for step six is a $1.3 million. Should we make that decision now before you go on to the rest of the budget? Uh, we certainly can, but it's already in the, in, it'll be in the approval. That step I six is in the approval. Step, okay. step six is in the approval, which is why it's uh, in bold face there. Go ahead. Yeah. So seeing as, as it was desirable by the board and also that it's a cheaper option, it, it, it's the one that we'll present this evening in, in the budget presentation. Uh, and then the final uh, um, consideration that we've made this evening, I won't go through it all again, but we are going to be able to, through existing funds, not asking for additional funds in our operating budget, is to reallocate that $20 a month employee health assurance, opt-out payments. All of our employees receive $20 a month if they do not choose our health care. We want to reallocate that money and change our, our enhanced uh, sick leave payout program from a $5,000 sick leave payout to a $10,000 sick leave payout. We've talked a lot about the benefits of this program. Uh, we think they far outweigh the $20 a month payment that uh, folks are receiving right now for not choosing our healthcare. Uh, and it's really a, pro it's a program we believe that's gonna keep our teachers in the classroom up until retirement and one that certainly incentivizes our teachers uh, upon retirement. So uh, if there's no questions about strategic plan goal number one objectives, then I'll certainly move forward. Next slide, please. So again, we talked about uh, many of these. Uh, I won't go through them in great detail again, but these are costs that are in our operating budgets that, that quite frankly, we can't avoid. Uh, we think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for our students, for us to join the Academy of Technology and Innovation, partnered with uh, the University of Mary Washington. That's a $59,000 um, uh, tuition fee for the school division. All of those associated costs listed on number, number two have to do with the Virginia Literacy Act, uh, textbooks, software, uh, and, and also um, th the third one there is the, the interventionist uh, positions that we will need in order to satisfy the requirements of the Virginia Literacy Act. All of those are in the operating request. Next slide. Uh, again, we just include strategic plan goal number three. This is our community collaboration and engagement. 
uh, goal. And all of these, all of these um, initiatives are of, of zero cost to the school division. And we certainly hope to implement them to uh, satisfy strategic plan goal number three. Next slide, uh, Ms. Higgins. Our final strategic plan goal is uh, safe, secure, and uh, healthy learning environments. Again, I'm going through this quickly. You can slow me down if you need to. Uh, we hope to transition the accounts payable and procurement positions back to the school board office. We believe that this will be a, a, a zero sum transfer, hopefully as we move forward. Uh, the second uh, thing to ensure safe uh, schools is to implement a secondary alternative education program. And uh, third, we would like to uh, apply and hopefully again receive school security officer grants from the state in the cost of $71,000. And finally, when we made the initial budget presentation, it, uh, the cost, and, and we'll hopefully approve that this evening, was $146,000 to finish the radio uh, project cost that the county initiated. We were able to pay for those uh, radios through the use of ESSER funds, and we've now removed them from the operating budget request. Next slide. So I'm gonna work our way towards the end uh, so we can do this relatively quickly. These are just the, the cost of the positions, uh, or excuse me, the cost of the extra things in the budget builder. I, I will obviously go through greater detail uh, uh, when, when I present this to the Board of Supervisors. Next slide. This is our, uh, again, nothing has changed here. This is the additional positions in the operating budget. Next slide. So again, these are the major differences and these are the real costs associated with our operating budget request this year. So you'll see the first major cost is the 1% for all staff and then the relieving of compression. So, so that uh, cost is a total of about $2.3 million. Health insurance cost, as we've discussed, is 618,000. The additional things that are listed in the budget builder, and again, these are things like fuel and, and, and things that just naturally go up in cost, as healthcare did. Uh, that's an additional 515,000, and then the additional staff request is 718,000. Next slide. All right, so now this is new. So I'll, I'll slow down a little bit, because uh, this, this you have not seen yet. If you look at the far left column, uh, you will see how our funds are broken down. The light blue column, that second column there, is our FY operating uh, 24 budget. So you see FY 24, that bottom line uh, for all of our cost is $60 million across the school division. An important number to reference is the local revenue that is needed in order to make up that difference. So if you take a look at that first column, you'll see uh, in FY 24, we received $34 million from the state. $1.6 million in federal grants, and then we have some other, uh, some smaller revenue sources that are listed there as well, and, and those go into greater detail in your budget book. Also, I'll point out, you guys have a handout as well. The updated revenue document is here. You can review that, and if you wanna know what those other sources of federal funds and, and those state um, miscellaneous funds are, those are listed in this document as well. But most importantly, what you'll see here is after we updated our expenses, uh, if you looked at the governor's budget initially, the operating budget for FY24 is $64 million. That's that bottom line uh, in that middle blue section. You'll see that, that's, uh, that that would require a $25 million um, local revenue. And that's an increase of one point or one million one hundred twenty-four thousand four hundred and sixty-eight dollars from our local government. So that's that's the important thing to take from there. That red number there is the amount that we would be asking our board of supervisors for additional on top of our existing allocation from from this this uh, fiscal year. So after we received the general assembly. Uh, updated budget, you'll see the far right-hand column. So everything we just discussed in uh, all four of those budget, uh, all four of the uh, strategic plan initiatives, all of the positions, the healthcare increase, the compression at step six, all of those things. Uh, again, the bottom line cost is $64 million. The additional funds that we would need based on the general assembly budget from the Board of Supervisors is $122,000 
uh, $122,648. Okay. So we've worked really hard. Uh, you know, we've we've watched a lot of our uh, of our um, board of supervisors meetings. We, we've taken a great appreciation for uh, where we are as a community, uh, and and we've also, I think, done a, a lot to try to satisfy many of the needs that we have in the school division, with the understanding uh, that our board of supervisors and our and our county are, are working through a number of challenging fiscal issues right now, uh, and I think we'll present to them a, a very fair and a very progressive budget for the school division. Uh, next slide. Uh, quick question, if I may. Yes. Uh, so for that total, what did that assume as far as raises for staff? Uh, the question is, Is does that total, the, the 122,000 include the staff raises? Well, the $64 million total spent, is that? Yes. Was it assumed that's, that's a 3% COLA? Yes. So, everything yeah. so, so that includes everything in the uh, operating budget request. So as far as compensation is concerned, it includes the 1% overall plus the step and the adjustment at step six for compression. And the so we're doing a one, that's assuming a 1% COLA. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And a step. Right. And the compression at step six. Okay, so that's because we talked before the possibility of a 3%. At, so that's not anything that the state's talking about anymore, or the assembly? Well, we we met that threshold with a 1% plus step because our, our average step. Oh, the step counts for that. Yes, the step counts for that. Yep. So any additional questions on, on this slide? No. And there's some, still some employees that won't get a 2% step, right? For, for some, so how's that work? That what they look at is the overall number and make sure that we've met that threshold and, and we've by far met that threshold. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, what you'll see here on the left-hand side is uh, upgrade by appro uh, appropriation or increases by appropriation. Fiscal year 24, uh, in, that, in that far left column, you'll see what we're operating on this year. If you remember, our composite index changed, right? Uh, it went from 38 roughly to 36. Uh, and 36 and some change. Last year, our composite index, based on the amount of money that our local funding, of, that our uh, local uh, legislative body afforded us, was 39.8%. Um, happy to report that after working through a number of challenging uh, budget issues, whether you're looking, if you look at the General Assembly budget, our, our local composite index will, will drop to 37%. So what, what this means is that uh, we are, uh, fortunate enough to receive much more state funding uh, moving forward and, and relying on our local government much less, uh, which, which I think is, is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so next slide. And then again, I think this will be the final slide. This just shows the major updates that we've made since we made the initial presentation. Um, and, and, and where we are this evening, you'll see the healthcare uh, savings, you'll see the savings from that rather large radio project, and then you'll see the cost, uh, the estimated cost of the compression at step six. Uh, so with, with that, Mr. Chair, I, if I could draw your attention to uh, the handout that I provided this evening, uh, and uh, I recommend, uh, and would need a motion uh, uh, by a board member. I recommend that we approve the King George County Schools FY25 proposed budget in the amount of $65,787,120 as presented on February 12th, 2024 and amended on March 25th, 2024. Do I have a motion? I move that we um, approve the superintendent's recommendation as stated. Okay, you might, it might be good to read it, um, okay. Ms. Hoover, if you I don't I recommend mind. that we approve the King George County Schools FY25 proposed budget in the amount of $65,787,187,120 as presented on February 12th, 2024 and amended on March 25th, 2024. Do I have a second? Second. Do we have further discussion? I just want to say to you and your team, Jesse, that I'm so proud and thankful for all the work you put into this. I mean, those numbers really show that you guys worked hard to, to really, I don't know. So thank you for all that. It's a lot of work. 
Yeah, I agree. It was a lot of work. And I think what I brought this up at a meeting a couple times. Are we sure we're not cutting ourselves too thin? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we need we need mental health specialists. We need behavior specialists. We need a lot of things. Uh, and, you know, I, are we cutting ourselves too thin? I understand what you're saying. There is all there's there's always need and 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 we could um we could always provide additional um need uh and it is our responsibility to create a needs based budget and and i I think we've tried to do that I think we've tried to do that uh with the understanding of of our current situation in our community. I think we've done that uh in a way that uh it's a budget. And, and I'll say this about last year, and I know the Board of Supervisors is different. I think we've done a very good job of working hand in hand and collaboratively with our Board of Supervisors. Uh, I, I hope that that effort continues as we move forward. Uh, could we ask for some additional things? Uh, most certainly, because as you know firsthand, in public education, there is always more need than, than we have the ability to address. Um, but, but I think, uh, given where we are as a community, I think we're going to put forward a, a budget that, uh, will show that we tried very hard to get many of the objectives satisfied, uh, that we have in our school division moving forward. I think we've made some very good progress with programs. Uh, and I think we've done that, uh, with the understanding that our county is, is in a position, uh, that, that's, um, it's, they're going to be very uh, austerious when it comes to how they take a look at the budget. I just hope we're not doing this at the expense of the students. Understood. Yeah, is there a way to, like, because he went to the preschool yesterday? Today. 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 Is there a way to, like, maybe ask, saying, hey, this is what we're presenting, but we are needing these teachers or whatever. Is there any way, if there's room for improvement on this budget, to have more money set aside, possibly? Do you see what I'm asking? No? Do you see what I'm asking? So like present it, I guess, but maybe saying if there's money to give, more money to give to us, can we take that and add it to the teachers? He has to present the budget the way it is. Yeah. But later on, if there's more budget, more money, maybe we can get something from them. I, if I can interject something, in talking to the Board of Supervisors these last couple of years, I've heard several times, you know, there's a whole lot of things that are in motion right now, as I'm sure you know, Ms. Davis and, and Dr. Boyd and several of us, in terms of possibly generating more revenue for the county. And uh, I've heard several times from various Board of Supervisors members, especially last year, not quite as much this year, that um, the county will be in a better place, hopefully, we don't know for sure, in the next year or two. And I think that's at the point, I mean, I hate to put it off because I do think we're, we've got a good, we're meeting the needs. Um, we just, uh, and we've just heard that um, there's not necessarily that many positions that we need to, to fill this year, which is wonderful. Of course, it could change within the next two months. Um, but then also the fact that I think that looking at being responsible of uh, a member of the whole county and an entity that is the largest uh, budget in the entire county, looking at the future of what I believe the county is looking at over the next couple of years in terms of more revenue, I think that's at the point that we can really look at making a difference um, in the next couple of years with doing some of those things that you're referring to, uh, Mr. Frank. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I, I think right now, uh, if you, if you and, and I know, Mr. Frank, you go to all the Board of Supervisors meetings, I, I think there's, there's hope that there's, there's a, you know, larger sources of revenue on the horizon. Uh, and, and I hope our Board of Supervisors cons considers the school division as, as we work our way towards um, many of those optimistic outcomes, uh, because the, the, the needs of the school division will increase. Uh, I think we've made good progress this year. I think uh, if you take a look at uh, the request, we're, we're doing, I think, what you see across the, the state, most certainly in the region when it comes to compensation. Uh, we're right there. Uh, that was our big push last year in making sure that we attract and retain high qualified teachers. I think we're holding ground there. I think if you take a look at uh, the, the fourth of, uh, goal in our strategic plan, uh, when it comes to school safety, we're making good progress there to make sure that we try to eliminate as many of the disruptions that we have during the school day so that 
inst uh, construction can continue uh, uninterrupted. We're making good progress there. Uh, and, and really implementing this, uh, we've gone to a number of trainings right now for, for the Virginia Literacy Act, uh, and we've sat in a room with 17 of the, of the regional school divisions. Uh, we are in a good place right now as it pertains to our implementation of the Virginia Literacy Act. Uh, and I think we're, our ability to cover those costs is going to really benefit our kids uh, learning how to read in, in K-1, 2, 3. We're covering those positions. We're covering the, the cost uh, associated with the needs of that program. So I, I think all in all, it's a win-win. It should be a win-win on, on, on both the school division side, and, and hopefully it's one that's seen in our county as, as one that's considerate of where our county is as well. Yeah, if I can, I really think that um, the Board of Supervisors will look at this budget as being very responsible, um, considering all the needs that we have and where the county is. And hopefully as you make the presentation similar to what you did tonight, I'm sure with the CALP tool, there'll be some other things that will change slightly. But um, I really think it'll be very favorable, I hope, to the Board of Supervisors without having to come back and be making a lot of changes. And I think that's very positive. And I also want to thank you, Dr. Boyd, there's a tremendous amount of work that you and your staff did. Um, I would ask now, as far as the CALC tool is concerned, before you make the presentation to the Board of Supervisors, I'm assuming that calculation tool uh, will be implemented and there may be some shifts in this. We'll do in the preliminary approval tonight or the approval. But I'm feeling pretty good. We, we received the CALC tool this evening and plugged in all of the numbers. Now, I think we're in pretty good shape with the current CALC tool that's okay. out. Okay. Uh, Ms. Williams and, and really the staff at the school board office worked extremely hard today okay. and, and, and crunching out those numbers. The only caveat I would say is that, as I mentioned on the front end of this, the, the governor has an opportunity to review this proposed budget from the General Assembly. He can make some slight modifications. He can make some large-scale modifications, quite frankly. However, moving forward with this evening and, and our presentation to the board, uh, uh, the, the Board of Supervisors, we'll be operating off of this council, and I'm feeling pretty confident about the numbers tonight. Good. Yeah. Any further discussion? That's my main concern. There's a, I don't remember last year. Was this, is this later than last year for getting the calc tool? Oh, very much. Yeah, yes. Right. So, so we've done a lot of theorizing about this. If you remember last year, there was the mistake in the calc tool. Oh, uh, yeah, right. So I, I, think, I think the department is being very cautious with releasing calc tools. Uh, our, our first time around doing this, they released a calc tool for the governor's budget, then one for the Senate, then one for the House, and we were receiving calc tool after calc tool and working through them constantly. Uh, they've been very hesitant in releasing a calc tool. They just finally did it today, and it's based on the General Assembly's uh, budget that they've passed together with the House and Senate. Uh, the, the only modification that's really left before approval is, is anything that the governor wants to adjust. And so I'm feeling pretty confident about where it currently sits, uh, barring the, the governor's adjustments. Good. Well, thank you, Dr. Boyd. All right. Um, it's been several minutes since we mentioned the motion. Let me read it one more time. Um, Ms. Hoover made the motion. It's recommended that we approve the King George County Schools FY25 proposed budget in the amount of $65,787,120 as presented on February 12th, 2024 and amended on March 25th, 2024. We've already had a motion and a seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries, the budget is approved. All right, next is the approval of the bus radios. So yes, sir, Mr. Chair, uh, King George County has, and this is the county, not the school division, has been renovating the two-way radio communication system for first responders and other county offices, including the school division. Uh, the approval of these funds this evening is to pay for the additional 28 APX 1500 mobile radios and installation for our school buses that were not included in the original quote. We've talked at length about this. Uh, we have received VO VDOE's permission to use ESSER 3 funds to pay for these radios. My, recomm my recommendation this evening is to approve $146,785 uh, for the purchase of the 28 APX 1500 mobile radios. Do I have a motion since this is an action item? Everybody see where it is? I'm struggling to find the page number. 
Um, it's actually, if you'll just click on the agenda portion and then just click on the approval of bus radios. I'm sorry, what page is it? 124. All right, 124. Starts. I move to make a motion to approve 146,785 towards radios for the buses. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye, motion carries. All right, food service account. Good evening, Chairman Board, Dr. Boyd, and I mean, Chairman Bush, Dr. Boyd, okay. and all assembled. Uh, I am here because um, I have an access balance of one million, yeah. yeah. And the state doesn't look at it that way. I, I know, but we're happy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the government. Uh, 1539000 And um, at this point, I, I think everybody has in their packet. Yeah, it's the um, This is the plan I've submitted to the state. And uh, they have approved it. I am sending in a addendum now to uh, add the CEP to it, which will cover all the elementary schools to um, have free meals for the next four years. So I was waiting Great. today to hear back from them to see if I could do it, if I qualified, and I do. So um, we're going to do that for the next four years for just the elementary schools. Outstanding. So if I could say, Mr. Chair, Ms. Davis and her staff have done a wonderful job uh, in our food services program to, to really be very profitable and, and, and uh, do a number of wonderful things. In reviewing this plan, uh, she's turning this money around and doing wonderful things and improving the, the, capital, uh, the capital improvements within the uh, food service uh, and cafeteria program in, in all of our county schools. So I, I can't commend you enough. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do I have a motion? I have a question. Okay. Um, well, sure. All right, go ahead. So I look at this action plan, Ms. Davis, and uh, in the top line, it says average monthly expense is roughly $200,000. But then if you look down in the table, and it has a list of expenditures, and number two in the list is average monthly expenditure, and there it says 602000 So is that one the three months that we're trying to yes. retain? Okay. Yes. That makes sense. That was all. I've got a question. We, on the, we were talking about one million five hundred thirty-nine thousand nine hundred eleven thirteen, but the total down here is one million five hundred forty-one. We're two thousand dollars off there somewhere. What is? Yes, because we have the option of going over or going under by like two thousand um, dollars. The thing is that. Even though I have gotten invoice well, bids on all of this stuff, um, it's just going to depend on how quickly they can do the work before the prices either go up. And some things have already gone down. But um, so I just, that was just my leeway. So none of this will be taken out of our money, though. It's all no ERSA funds. Yes, it, okay. it's all cafeteria funds. It's independent. Do no other questions? Do I have a motion? Well, I'll spend the comments. So yeah, thank you for saving so much money. And it's it does seem silly. The government's like, hey, too much money, you gotta spend it. So it's great that you're being so careful with the funds. Thank you. You always do a great job. <laughs> mm -hmm. Somebody, a motion. You do this. I make a motion to approve the excess balance in the food services account in the amount of one million five hundred thirty-nine nine hundred eleven dollars and thirteen cents. Second. Second by Mr. Frank. Any more discussion? Well, there is a question because we're, we're saying that, and um, to Mr. Frank's point, that's what they're saying was the excess amount, but we're trying to approve actually a little bit more than that, aren't we? The one hundred fifty-one forty one hundred. 540, sorry, 1,541,000 and change. So aren't we uh, coming up a little bit short with this uh, re recommendation here? No, we're not gonna come up a little short. Um, I have applied for a grant for 
$5,666. And Friday, I found out I was approved. So that comes off. Okay. That's a good question. Any others? And good answer. <laughs> yeah, it's a good answer, too. Thank you. Ms. Davis always has wonderful answers. She's, she comes prepared, I know. All right. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Um, now we go to the discussion items, the 2024 VSBA Business Honor Rule. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, if you take a look at the 2024 Virginia School Boards Association Business Honor Roll uh, proclamation in your packet, this is something that we do annually. We take a look at a local business that has supported the school division and through VSBA recognize that business through their uh, honor roll. Uh, we're not actually recognizing the business this evening. I'm requesting permission from the board this evening by signing this proclamation that in at a future board meeting, we uh, bring this business in so that we can recognize them. Uh, so this, this year, uh, I won't read the entire proclamation, but uh, at the end there, let it be uh, resolved that King George County School Board would like to name Rappahannock Goodwill Industries Incorporated to the 2024 Virginia School Boards Association Business Honor Roll, showing appreciation for the ongoing support of this community's pu uh, public schools. And uh, I ask permission uh, this evening by this proclamation that the board approve uh, the, the uh, Rappahannock Goodwill Industries for the Business Honor Roll through VSBA. Do I have a motion? Um, forgive me, because I'm not sure what they do for the schools. I, I read it and I totally trust you, but if you can just let, like, enlighten me on what they do for the schools. Sure, that's a good question. You want to speak to it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Rappahannock Goodwill Industries came in and worked with our students and trained them prior to the reverse career fair, and they provided, uh, a development of our students in resume writing, in um, using strong uh, uh, words in their resumes, and also presence, also uh, dress, and, and those kinds of things, and career preparedness types of things, so that they could be sex successful for the uh, reverse career fair. Thank you. Um, they also work with um, our students that are in a, uh, our special needs students that are transitioning into uh, employment. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hill. And it's all free. Wow. Okay, do I have a motion? I'll read it. So, whereas public schools and local businesses are an integral part of this community, and whereas many local businesses play a crucial role in supporting our schools, and whereas the economic health of our community, state, and nation depends on strong public school system, and whereas collaboration between local public schools and local businesses strengthens schools and the business community alike by providing a well-trained and highly educated workforce, and whereas an excellent public, public school system is vital to the quality of life in this community and fundamental to preserving a strong democratic society now and in the future, therefore be it resolved that the King George County School Board names Rappahannock Goodwill Industries Incorporated to the 2024 Virginia School Board Association Business Honor Roll showing appreciation for the ongoing support of this community's public schools. Your work has aided this community in focusing on the goal of providing the best public schools we can for every child who attends them. Do I have a second? I second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye, motion carries. And I think we have something to sign here. Yes. As we're doing this, everybody would open up the policy manual updates. Do you want to sign this, man? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> First one is BDDC-F2, and that has to do with the um, special meeting and the work session and change to the agenda. Dr. Boyd, did you want to make any comment about that? I certainly can. So uh, if you, uh, our, for our regular meeting and our work session, or excuse me, for our regular meeting, we had updated to include uh, invocation. 
uh, at the at the request of the chair, we also went back and updated the special meeting and work session work session agenda to include uh, invocation as well. So that is item number two under that agenda in in your uh, board packet. Okay, I don't know if this has to be. Is there any discussion about it? I think we could probably just change this to an action item unless there's a problem. Any discussion? If there's no real discussion, then uh, let's um, make a motion unless there's a discussion to make this an action item. It's a discussion. We don't need a motion right to make an action. We can. We no, can. I mean, excuse, make a motion to approve this policy rather than waiting until next time to make it an action item. It's under yeah. discussion this time. Oh, so Mr. let's go ahead and make Mr. a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve this uh, change to the special meeting slash work session agenda. I second. Yeah. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. It's approved. So we will have an invocation also at the beginning of any work session. All right. Next one is a BDDH uh, slash KD. Dr. Boyd. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Chair, at the request of the chair, uh, if you take a look at that policy, we revised the, uh, if you're looking at the second sentence, we revised that final sentence in that paragraph. So formerly the, that sentence said, the school board has the discretion to limit public comment, uh, uh, to limit it to dependent upon the individuals who have a relationship to the school division or residency status uh, in King George County. What we would like to have that statement say now, as opposed to the, uh, the school board has discretion is public comment is limited to individuals who have a relationship to the school division or residency status in King George County. If I could say something that really was, it's something that we've already kind of been doing and we decided I believe almost a year ago, except there was a wording that said it was a discretion um, as to whether we would allow outside people to speak during public comments. And I had made, and we've already talked about this a little bit, but it hasn't been formalized in a discussion setting that we truly limited it to individuals who have a relationship with the school or are residents of King George County, rather than saying we might let other people speak. I was, I felt it's very important because we could have items such as what happened during COVID and all that, or we could have other serious kinds of discussions where people from outside um, might come in and um, make um, even a protest. And um, at some level, I would have the discretion as to whether I would allow them to make a public comment or not make one. Obviously, anybody from King George I'd want to, we'd allow, and anybody that has a relationship. But those entities that may come from outside our state or outside our jurisdiction and have an agenda to protest or whatever, um, I think that we, as much as we can, put that in policy that that won't be done. It doesn't mean that certain organizations couldn't do a presentation, obviously, yes, absolutely. But to as far as a public comment, we'd limit that, that to people who are here in King George or have a relationship with the schools. Sure, yeah, I, I agree in principle. I might have a little more to say about it. For something just straightforward first, I'll just be grammar police real quick. and. Okay. So where it says individuals, that's possessive. I mean, it's plural, not possessive. So the apostrophe should come out of that. But my more substantive comment is, uh, it says whoever relationship to the school division. That's that seems pretty vague. I mean, I think when we're, I think you know, I originally proposed this a couple of years ago or something. And my intent was like a familiar relationship, so like parents, grandparents, or legal guardian. So. You know, because you see a relationship like, well, you know, I went to a King George football game once, or I, you know, I volunteered for an hour one time, so now I can tell you everything I think about everything. So you want to be even more specific is what you're saying? Than just and what do you think about that if we said, made it, uh, said, it's employees, students, parents of a student, grandparents or a legal guardian of a student, and that's, that's what it is. Along those lines. We don't, we, we'd want to be sure that we covered everything. Um, aunts, uncles, grandparents, would, would that include aunts and uncles too? I think that's why the word relationship was put, but you have a very valid point. Um, you say familial relationship? Well, because we have to, we also have to add employees, you know, because they... That's true. That would Other thoughts? You, I thought the same thing, Matt, when I was looking at it. I was like, ooh, relationship, that kind of is very broad. 
But if we, that would leave out the special visitors coming in that maybe aren't from King George or go to King George schools, but they're representing something that you said we would allow just now? No, 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 I said those people who might be protesting or something that we would not allow them because they're not from King George, yeah. but they could do a presentation. Presentation, yeah. That's all. That's not part of the board comments though. Okay. That'd be by invitation. That would be by invitation, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's Thank a little, you. but you're right. That's Thank a little different category. This is only those doing that three minute okay. board um, uh, public comment. Any other thoughts about what Mr. Roll said? Could we just put a generalization like a familial right, relationship, you know, or or legal? Because there may be somebody that, you know, legally is tied to somebody in the county. Yeah, I think if we said familiar, we'd have to say specifically employees and legal guardians. But if you go above that, it does give examples, staff member, student, parent, committee member, and indicate in which district they reside in. So that's making a clear relationship as far as right there to me. Yeah, student, parent, community member. I think what they're saying is well, then what about grandparent? And that's the whole term of relationship. Yeah, it's not all inclusive list there. It's just some examples. All right, so other thoughts on that? Mr. Frank, did you have a? I don't have anything. Dr. Boyd, what's, um, what do you think about that? About being more specific? I just share the same concern you have was as to whether or not we can sit here and think about all, all of those it. different relationships yeah. that may exist. I mean, when you think about it too, you know, we as a board would determine that relationship if someone was to come here and making your point. And that actually did happen at the last board meeting. Mm -hmm. And I was a little hesitant. I think that's probably what you were referring to a little bit, uh, Mr. Rolls. If you remember at the last board meeting that someone had said that they had um, they were an author that had come to a class and spoke in the class and had, and also said he had volunteered. Mm -hmm. And um, because I did call him on that when I realized that he wasn't from King George and was not a teacher, didn't have a relationship. And I'll be honest, I was a little uncomfortable with my decision, but I felt in the context of what was going on, I thought it was appropriate. At least he did have some sort of relationship. But if this goes through, um, I would probably recognize that at the beginning and basically say, no, just because you showed up one day and came to a class doesn't mean that you have a relationship. This right here, I would have said no to that person last month in the context, but I would have told that person ahead of time. It would not be something I would do in the middle of when they're doing that, but to not have anything in place like this, that would be difficult. Does that make sense? So I guess, uh, Mr. Rolls, I think I agree with you, but I'm afraid that if we start to list the individual things or say familial, and what about an uncle who's happens to be, you know, living or from Fredericksburg, but is the uncle and is the primary caregiver, but they live in Fredericksburg and they say, well, okay, I'm just an uncle, but I am very involved with my well, so familiar would, would cover that way or not. A familiar would cover that. Yeah. So board, what do you think? Change it, leave it, change it to familial, which any family relationship and then include obviously yeah, I don't think we're going to wordsmith it perfectly right now, but if we agree in principle, yeah, it's a familiar relationship and then employees, legal guardians, is there, does that pretty much cover it? If employees, legal guardians, and familiar relationships? To a student, of course, we're talking about familiar yeah. relationship, yeah. I'm trying to think if that covers everything. We don't have to decide right now. I guess we can think about it. And Bring it. All right. All right. Let's put this back for a possible action item with those three changes. If it's all right with the board, is that ag agreeable? So, just so I'm clear, you said um, Emilio, employee, employee, guardian, parent, well, familial, parent, guardian, employee, or familial. That would include grandparents, parents, and even aunts and uncles. Yeah. If we think of anything else now and then, we can add it next time. Yeah. Put that. That's true. So we'll put that as an action item with those changes next time, Dr. Boyd. Otherwise, the concept will remain the same and it will be limited only to those people. All right, let's go on to the next discussion item. Um, it is KDDL, electronic participation in committee meetings. Dr. Boyd. 
Yeah, so Mr. Chair, this is uh, a VSBA recommended policy, and this is uh, almost a mirror policy to what we've been doing as a school board for some time. Uh, as you know, com uh, committee meetings are, are public meetings, and they fall under the same uh, expectations that we have for, for any public meeting. What this policy would allow um, a committee member to do would be attend virtually, similar to uh, how a board member could attend to a, a, a school board meeting virtually uh, for a certain percentage of meetings through a certain you know, a calendar year. It's the same, very same policy uh, for committee meetings. Any questions about that? This is for board members. No, this will oh, be no, no. for committee members. Committee we members. already have one for, for board members that's in policy. This will be for uh, any committees that we have uh, and committees, committee members' ability to attend virtually. You like the cell phone committee that he just had? Yeah. Something along those lines. I did have a question about this, not necessarily related to that specifically, that any time that a committee is chosen, um, either by the school board, directed by the school board to have a committee or your direction. And I'm making the assumption, which I think is a good assumption, that if you were to make a decision, you know, about having a committee in order to inform the board about something, you would tell us that you're forming a committee. That's an assumption, I'm sure, that's always there. Yes, and so th there, we have an actual, um, I'm trying to remember where it's listed, but we have official committees that are listed that we all serve on. Right. So this is in reference to those committees. This isn't like an ad hoc committee, like a, a school level okay. uh, committee or something of that nature. This would be in reference to those official committees uh, that we have established. All right, I misunderstood that. Okay, well, thank you. I was thinking it meant all committees. So if we were to direct you to form a committee for whatever reason, that would not be part of this policy. It would depend how you go to win about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. It would depend. So right now we have that, I want to say it's a policy where we have our official, I think seven or eight official committee, right, right. Uh, special ed technology right, 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 and so right. on. Uh, if you went about it that way, then yes, it would fall under this category. If you, if you just direct me as a superintendent to say, I'd like you to look into the cell phone policy and erect a committee, uh, that it wouldn't. Okay. Would not. All right. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. All right. Any other discussion yeah, about I'll this? I was going to bring up. You know, thinking I was maybe going to call Elizabeth Ewing about this. But I, I've read it several times now. I'm trying to it read differently than when I read it last night. That first sentence is really confusing. I'm not really sure exactly what it says. So I might have to think about that more between now and then. And it's just confusing. Yeah, is it, what you're trying to say, like I said, we don't do telephonic. Is that, is that what you're trying to say? I mean, because aren't, aren't we giving some... Except as provided hereafter. Yeah, there's a lot of caveats that you're like, okay, so what are you trying to say? Yeah, it is a bit confusing. I, I think it says, it's basically reminding us of what our responsibility is as a school board, uh, it, that we do not, that we are unable to connect, uh, conduct any meeting where public business is discussed if if individuals or members of that meeting are not physically assembled. If they're if so, in other words, they're reminding us that, you know, we um, prior to approving this policy as it pertains to committees are not able to have that public committee meeting and those individuals that aren't there participate in that meeting um, legally. Does that make sense? unless now we pass this policy and they could do it virtually, similar to the same thing we do for board meetings now. Okay, so for board meetings, we have to have a quorum physically assembled for individuals to participate remotely. Is your readiness to say the same thing? Uh, I don't see mention of a quorum. I, 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 similarly, though, I'm, I'm reading this to say that uh, in relation to public business, we, you know, right now without this policy, and I really don't even know physically how you would do this, but if a member is not present uh, at that committee meeting, they cannot weigh in on the business of that committee meeting uh, or any in any way participate, maybe provide notes or some way of, of um, directing the business of that public meeting. Uh, I think that sent, this sentence, that first sentence, and I believe, I, I agree with you, it's very confusing, is reminding us that we cannot do that. Now, with this policy, 
we will have the ability moving forward for that individual, if they can't attend in person, to attend virtually to that meeting and so, participate. Yeah, person is like, you can't do this. And then it's like, well, but maybe you can. Like, the rest of the policy well, it's like is kind of weird. both things. Yeah. It's like in the first sentence, you're saying you can't, and then later on, it says you can. It's reminding us that we can't on the front end, unless we, uh, unless we pass I this see. policy. I see. Oh, yeah. right. That's very confusing. Yeah, it is. It, it, BSBA came up with this? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can't take credit for it. <laughs> okay, could we make this a little simpler? Less confusing, yeah. Less confusing, Dr. Boyd, and say the same thing? Or are we asking a little much? <laughs> oh. I guess this is what I read before I was in my mind. I was going to have to follow up with Ms. Ewing just to discuss it, which, which I can do. Haven't had a chance yet. So you're saying you want to discuss this with Ms. Ewing? Yeah, I might ask her about it. <laughs> All right. She's your buddy, right? <laughs> okay. All right. That's fine. Then we'll, uh, if we'll table this for, I guess, further discussion next time after some discussion with some VSBA personnel. Is that all right, Dr. Boyd? I, uh, actually, all of these are discussion items. So, All right. We will do that. Thank you. Maybe I could be on that call, too, Mr. Rolls. If you'd like. Pardon? If you'd like. Yeah, I would. <laughs> all right. Let's go to the next one. Um, uh, D, uh, DJF, purchasing procedures. So as I read this, the only update here is not only uh, the... Um, reference of a crime, but also the solicitation of any such crime. Right. And just includes that caveat. I think that was very good. Any discussion about that? That's the only change to this policy. Are we talking about DJF or something different? DJF, yes. Okay. DJF, he's, he's got there at the first paragraph, the last sentence, and then the third paragraph, last sentence, all saying the same thing child or solicitation of any such offense. It's just adding the concept of soliciting. I'm good with that. You want to make that an action item or do you want to? I agree. Until next time. I, I'm good either. I, I mean, if we're ready to pass it, we're pass it right now. All right. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve file DJF as presented. You have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. All right, good. I like saving time. All right, next one is the GBEC and JFCH and KGC. Yes, yeah, so again, this is just, uh, again, from VSBA, and this is just updating cross-references, so making sure that GBEC references JFCH and K. Uh, GC, nothing in this policy as far as substance has changed other than the cross-references. So I'm going to approve that. Well, I did have a question, and it doesn't, I, I'm fine to approve this too. Is As I was reading through this, it made me think of something that Dr. Boyd and I attended, and I think and we have mentioned it, is um, vaping products, even if they don't contain um, marijuana, CBD, or any kind of nicotine, that even the flavorings can be very deadly. And I was thinking, Do we, I was asking Dr. Boyd today, do we have a policy that talks about simply vaping a, uh, a flavor, which apparently is even, can be even more deadly than tobacco or marijuana? I thought that was odd, but she presented it and it was kind of scary to be honest. But do we have any policy? That's what I was referring to when I, earlier today, Dr. Boyd, that refers only the vape pipe itself, no matter what it contains? Only the only policy that I've recognized is this one. We've talked is is this one that uh, recognizes tobacco products and nicotine vapor products. Could could you um, maybe look into that a little bit more? Maybe ask some of the other, especially in reference to what we attended back a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. Just really concerned that um, some of our students putting some of those flavoring things. Do they even realize? And we need to have something in place that. As we capture that, if we see it's not nicotine and it's not CBD, but it's some flavoring, is that we confiscate that pipe because we don't want the children to be harmed. Absolutely. All right. Dr. Ward, down on the cross-references, they've got, they've marked out the standards of student conduct. I mean, shouldn't, they, shouldn't we have something in there about the code of conduct since that's just the JFCR regulation. We, we do have it in our code, our actual code of conduct. Okay. 
All right. All right, do I have a motion to approve this then rather than waiting? Because it's only that one small change. So you're... You asked Dr. Boyd to look into it, but... It would be, a, in my mind, it would be a separate policy. This is basically having to do with nicotine and vaping and nicotine only. Okay. But I would like, yeah, Dr. Boyd to look at some other policy and maybe even at some point in the future, Dr. Boyd, putting the vaping, whether it's CBD or whether it's tobacco, I know there's different consequences, but putting that maybe into one policy, I don't know. But right now, this is just the tobacco. Do I have a motion? I move that we approve policy GBEC as presented. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye, motion carries. I like saving time. All right, file GC. Professional staff. So again, just a, a policy to uh, reflect the updated amendment to the Virginia Code 22.1299. Uh, not a whole lot of substance there, but you'll see um, just the update in the uh, policy reference. I did have a question on this one. So the first sentence says, no teacher is regularly employed by the school board or paid by from public funds unless such teacher and list some things that don't wouldn't apply to a uh, substitute teacher. So do we not consider a substitute teacher to be a teacher regularly employed by the school board? Where are you reading from? The very first sentence. Very first sentence, a teacher regularly employed. So your question is whether or not a substitute is considered a teacher under this uh, definition? Right, because the next three things list uh, all sound like they would not apply to a substitute teacher, and we do obviously employ substitute teachers who don't meet those criteria. So I'm just wondering if that's some sort of kind of weird terminology thing where they're not considering a substitute teacher to be a teacher regularly employed by the school board. Well, it says teacher requirements have been waived by the Virginia Department of Education. Third bullet one. On the third bullet, it kind of gives an exception. Well, it's for teacher to teach a trade or industrial education program. Oh. Or, oh, I guess. Well, and for so that wouldn't apply to like a math teacher. Oh, I see, yeah. So your question is, is specifically, does this also relate to substitute teachers or not? And, and how doesn't it? Do you want to speak to it? Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, that's in one of the other, that's in GCE. It's, um, yeah, I think so the rest, uh, the, as I read through the rest of this policy too, it has to do with licensure requirements mainly. Right. So uh, substitute teachers would not right. fall under that category. I mean, it's not considered them regularly employed. That's, it's a temporary arrangement, so. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, so really then the only change with this is that during the original three, it's just simply having to do the licensure and that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, he, Matt fixed it because he said no teacher is regularly employed. Yeah, it's just not as obvious as it could be, but. That's true, you're right. Again, something a little unclear. All right, do you want to, I don't see any real problem with this. Do you want to also make that into a motion? What? Sure. To approve this one, this file, um, GC, instead of having it a discussion, we'll make it into a motion. Sure. Mr. Chairman, I recommend that we approve file GC uh, as amended. I second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. It is accepted. All right, next um, policy is GCBD-R, a regulation. So again, this is just removing the, this is a change in title. This is removing professional. Uh, it was traditionally called professional staff leave benefits. It's now staff leave benefits because it includes all of our staff and not just our professional staff. I think that's a wonderful change too. All right, what was it before? I'm rather curious. Did staff had a separate one? It was professional staff before. And then what was this? Okay, what was just the staff then? So it was professional staff. Now it's all staff. Now it's all staff. Before it was just professional. So before, what about the other staff? Is there what another policy? <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so you, okay, even though it wasn't really written that way, that's what you used it anyway. So basically, this is proving something of what we've been doing anyway. All right, thank you. All right, same thing. Do I, any further discussion? If not, can I have a motion? I move we approve policy GCBD-R. I guess I should say regulation as presented. Do I have a second? I second. Any further discussion? Dr. Ward, I've just got a question on that. Uh, from what I understand of what I've, what I've seen in the past is that most school divisions do not give the whole spring break to 245 day employees, is that correct? We haven't done a survey recently. I can survey our regional superintendents. I can tell you that um, we've had a lot of conversations about when, sup when uh, super, uh, spring break has been offered lately. Many school divisions are on spring break this week and next. Um, I, I think it may, it may vary, but I haven't surveyed anyone lately. Is that a possibility? Yeah, we can. I can send out a survey. So your question. Right, thank you. Go ahead. No, my question. Well, I see your question is concerning a 12 month employee. Yes, a 245 day employee. And is there, it's assumed that they would be here during spring break or are, not? Or are other school, what are other school divisions yeah. do as? Uh, you know, I, I, I see a lot of them that, you know, they have two days off during spring break instead of the whole five days, five, okay. five work days. But is there anybody that you spoke to specifically, anybody you want uh, me to reach no. out to? Uh, Stafford, maybe Spotsylvania. I'm not sure which one we were talking about at the time. Okay. okay. So according to this, we give that, and you're just wondering how common that is, that we that we give the spring break off to 245-day employees. Right. Yeah. How common is it? Is that is that what you're... We've done it since that? I've been here. But I mean, I'm just asking, is that the same thing other school divisions do? Yeah. I can tell you, I'm sorry, I won't even say the name of the state. <laughs> I can tell you that my experience in the past is 12 month employees do generally have either all or most of spring break off, but a lot of times we can't take it off because there's just things that you have to do. I'll bet Dr. Boyd could confirm that. You're, you're in the time of year that you just can't always do that. Oh, and I understand, and that's, that's my point, is that that's, that's the time of year I would think that the most work would be got done when all the teachers and all the students are gone, then that's when the real work can begin. Well, I, and I can tell you that it, based on recent experience, myself included, many of those that had pressing deadlines were, were working over that time. And I would, yeah, I was, that's my experience too. But however, it is listed that you could take that time off. So what usually happens is they'll take two or three days at the most maybe one day, maybe do the three-day weekend or whatever, I mean, but usually they have to work at least some or all. That's Mr. a good Chairman? question. Yes. Was it Texas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said I wouldn't say it because I always say that. <laughs> all right. Uh, do we have a motion to approve this? Or do we already make the motion? I'm sorry. We were in discussion, weren't we? Yeah. We were, uh, yeah remember I mean, where we are. All right. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Was there a vote? Aye. Uh, was it seconded? I'm not sure. Yeah, it was. It's usually asked for a second for a discussion after it's seconded. Okay. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. All right. We are on the next one, which is, oh, let me see. GCE. GCE, substitute teachers, the one we're referring to a moment ago. Yes. Okay. So my notes here are the title of the policy is changed and the policy updated to reflect enactment of Acts 2023. So again, this is coming from, uh, as a reference there, House Bill 2457, and increasing our ability to uh, further employ substitute teachers for an extended period of time. Uh, you will see uh, some minor changes there as far as the completing of the background check. Uh, but most importantly, you'll see that during the uh, 2023, 2024, 2024, and 2025 school years, King George County School Board may employ a substitute teacher to fill a vacancy uh, for a period not to exceed 180 days uh, during one school year. Many school divisions are passing this policy right now given the, the teacher shortage. Any further discussion or comments at the changes that they made? Dr. Moore, are we requiring, if we do that for 180 days, are we requiring them to take any courses like in classroom management or anything like this uh, that we can, that we pay for? 
Uh, we're not re requiring them to. However, many of our substitute employees that take on that level of responsibility oftentimes end up working for a license or initial licensure or something of that nature. So I know in speaking with HR, if they're working as a substitute teacher, they're probably also taking courses and classes and things of that nature. It's nothing that we require, quite frankly, because we're trying to find these individuals to do this job. Yeah. Let me ask a question in relation to this now, and this is something you probably know, or Mrs. Zersky knows, is um, I just know, <laughs> I won't mention the state again, but um, that if you are substitute and you substitute more than 90 days, it counts as a full year. Is there anything like that in Virginia? In other words, if you go to the 91st day, one day past a semester in the other state I was part of, in terms of your retirement, even if you're a substitute, that counts towards a year towards your retirement. Do we have anything like that? So none of the substitutes um, get any of that as counted towards their... Yeah, that is very different. Okay. Now, that's fine. I just thank you for clarifying that. That helps me understand even more about living here. <laughs> Dr. Boyd, uh, see, we've been having long-term subs for some time now, right? Because we've, we've had a, t a teacher shortage. So this is just, listen, this year and next year. So I think we're just already doing that under like a waiver from the Board of Education. We just didn't have it in a local policy. Yep. That's good. Yeah. Also, it will prevent that. Yeah, thank you for the clarifications. That's very good. Any further discussion on this? I think this will save the division a lot of time and effort. All right, if there's no uh, further discussion or any changes to this, again, we can do this like we've done several others. Do I have a motion? I move that we approve file GCE as submitted. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye, and GCE is approved. All right, um, GCE-R. Yes, yeah, so this was a former regulation from hmm, 1992. <laughs> and so currently we do not have a program where we have administrative interns. Uh, so we are asking to uh, omit this policy, this regulation, excuse me. Any discussion? No. I move that we strike regulation GCE-R from the policy manual. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. It is removed. All right. IGBD. IGBD is... Oh, no, uh, IGBG. IGBG uh, just <laughs> changes the uh, title of, uh, from nurse practitioner to advanced practice registered nurse. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? It just sounded like we were rapping or something. <laughs> yeah. I'll I move that we approve policy IGBG as presented. Second. Any further discussion? It's only that one small change. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Policy is changed. All right. Cell phone and personal communication devices, JFCK. So this is one I know we've talked about quite a bit and certainly up for discussion. Uh, this policy uh, coming out of the board set, coming out of the board work session, uh, at the request of the board, was to include the rationale. That's the first two policies, basically describing uh, some of the concerns that we have with adolescent cell phone use and its effect on um, instruction within schools. And then the uh, second section under cellular phones and other portable uh, telecommunication devices is in general um, the, the board's desire to limit the use of cell phones um, within the uh, public school buildings. Um, if you would, um, Mr. Frank had sent an email 
to um, just before the board meeting started. And in uh, for discussion, I'll let Mr. Frank talk about that. Um, but he um, had some recommendations. And so if you could open up the email, because um, he only has a, one copy, and that way you can be looking at what Mr. Frank is gonna be talking about. Give everybody a second to open up the email. <clears throat> okay, go ahead, Mr. Frank. All right, I'll make some changes. Hopefully it'll uh, uh, take care of some of the confusion that may be there. Um, uh, in the second paragraph, line three, it says the school aims, I think there should be the school board aims. Second paragraph, line three. Okay, hold on, make sure we're on the same place. Second paragraph where it says, the school board aims, you're saying in the other one that Dr. I, Boyd did, it just said the school. The school. So you wanna add the word board. Yes, board. yes. Okay. And then going down to the next three paragraphs there, the meat of this whole policy. Um, and I've taken out some of the, the things that I thought were confusing in there uh, and I changed it to uh, what you guys can see what Dr. Boyce said, right? What, what the original one said, right? Change to the use of portable, the use of portable communication devices, such as cell phones and or hellhole and health computer devices by any person or property controlled by the school board to engage in unlawful and unauthorized activity is prohibited. It takes out when such devices are being used as communication device, it takes out including vehicles. Um, and that just to me drops the confusion away because there's no way a, a bus driver is gonna be able to see what a, a student is doing on the phone back there anyway. Uh, and then on weekends or whatever, when they're going to track meets or, or football games or whatever, you know, they're, they're gonna be on their phones. So I see no reason to have uh, vehicles in there. All right, the next one, which is the real meat. Do you wanna discuss that as a whole, Mr. Frank, or each one? Well, you can put the discuss paragraph at a time. Let's stop with that one for a moment. Well, I do have a question about that paragraph, even just in the original. I wonder what the intent was, because basically in the end it just says that unlawful and unauthorized activity is prohibited, which isn't that just true by definition? So I wasn't really sure what that paragraph accomplished or what the intent was. Dr. Boyd? I, I think that was just to, you know, if we have to reference this and confirm that in policy, we are saying that unlawful use of it is, is prohibited. It's again, it, we're borrowing it from Virginia Beach. This is the same policy you recommended. Yeah. I, yeah, I didn't read that that closely, but um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's from you. <laughs> oh, that's all I had for that. If Mr. Frank wants to continue. Okay, are we, we're at the next paragraph now. All possession or use of portable communication devices such as cellular telephones or other handheld computing devices shall be prohibited at each school to prevent disruption of the educational environment and to maintain order on school property during the instructional day. Uh, on that one, I've taken out uh, what was in parentheses, which is um, when such devices being, and, and then shall be regulated and or, I took that out, uh, prohibited at each school or event as deemed necessary. I took or school event as deemed necessary out. Um, I mean, if we leave that now, I think we're right back to where we are right now. So the big thing is, is that um, you're saying absolutely prohibited, not putting in any regular, that could be regulated by the administration or whatever. Yes, uh, prohibited during the instructional day, before school, before 725 for the high school, after 735, up to after 235 for the high school, you know, they're, they're on their, they can do whatever. Well, not whatever, but they can use their phones. We had that caveat about the lunch at the high school level. Are we? I I think it's going to be too hard and to put too much work on teachers to regulate that, regulate and 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 control that. 
I mean, we don't need to put any more on their plates than they already have. Sure. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but the problem is, you know, making it so, I mean, I agree with you. I would love to be able to do this where it's strictly prohibited. In fact, I, I said that to Dr. Boyd on a phone call today. I said, I would like that word to be regulated to be not there. However, it does sort of tie the hands of administration a little bit, because here's the problem. And we talked about this in our work session a little bit is should we make a policy that say 50% of the teachers, no matter what policy we make, they're not going to uphold it. Well, you know, in other words, let me finish a little bit. I think that we need to make a policy that allows the administrators in the schools to come up with the processes and administration of that policy and allows them some freedom rather than saying, absolutely not, you can't do it. And then, then they're stuck with a problem, just like you're talking about. Then they're stuck with a real problem, you know, because you've got teachers that are saying, you know, uh, there's a lot of battles I want to fight. That's not one of them. I'm not doing it. Um, and so you have to say, okay, what would be the consequence to a teacher who's not going to do it? Now it's back on the backs of administrators. Then what do they do? Because now we're going to have to have a series of consequences for teachers that won't follow it. We well, hold them accountable. How? And, you know, how do we hold them accountable? That's something that we have to look at because uh, we've had this policy in place for years and we've thrown it out because we weren't holding anybody accountable. That's, can we hold somebody accountable if they do not want to be held accountable? Well, can't fire them. You can't fire them. You can put stuff in their record. Yes Dr. or Boyd, no? Yeah, well, okay. I'm I'm speaking from my past experience. It's more important. Yeah, I understand. I understand both point of view. I, the only thing I, I would bring up again too is is um, and this was talked about quite extensively in this cell phone committee meeting of of providing some opportunity uh, for our secondary age students during uh, the uh, day in order to adjust their schedule. Uh, it came up a lot where. Um, you know, practice is canceled or something happens in their afternoon, they don't have a doctor's appointment or whatever, providing that one opportunity to, to, to make that arrangement. I think we're so, I don't I think we as adults are very accustomed now to, to making those adjustments on the fly uh, via the level of communication that we have now. I, I think if we don't provide that opportunity, then what we're saying is that all of that is going to run through the main office. And I don't know that in today's society, uh, that's a reasonable expectation for 50, for a 1500 student school to all run their afternoon schedule changes through, through the main office, similar to maybe what happened in the, in the past. I see that as being a very challenging uh, thing to, to get accomplished, would you say? I like the lunch idea because of what you're saying is that they're updating and everything. But what I don't like is the wording necessarily because it almost is the same as it already was, shall be regulated. That's kind of already how it is. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work because the teachers don't want that responsibility. And I believe the high school wanted to leave it up to the teachers to decide and I don't particularly want to leave that burden on them to decide. So yeah. maybe allow them the lunchtime so they can update their parents or their work schedules or, or practices, rides, whatever, but change the wording of that so it doesn't leave it up to the teacher. I, I agree. I, I think we need to, so. And not because the teacher's not capable, just to take the burden off of them. Yeah, I agree. What we don't, what we don't want to do is get into the weeds of, of how that practice is going to be put into effect but we have to write a policy with language that provides that if, if it's the if it's in the you know the agreement of the board to allow for something like that. So we don't want to go as far as saying in in this policy from the board level that we want to prohibit cell phones except for cafeteria use or whatever. But we have to provide some level of language that says uh, we prohibit with 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 an exception with a caveat. Uh, you know per administrative approval or, or something of that, um, of that level. And I guess that's what I'm saying too. Let me ask you a question, Dr. Boyd, in reference specifically to Mr. Frank. If you were to just say that it's prohibited no matter what, it cannot be in the classrooms, it cannot be in the hallways, it cannot be anywhere. 
Um, how would the, um, how do you believe teachers would react to that? It would vary. I, I think we have some teachers that, that are very much willing to die on this hill. I think we have, some, and I say it because that's exactly what, I mean, yeah. and, and I think, and I think some teachers uh, will decide that that's not a battle that they want to fight. And quite frankly, that's the case as a former high school principal with most policies across the board. That's correct. The question is, uh, in this world right now, in this environment where we're talking about and adjusting policies that have to do with our ability to retain and, and, and attract qualified teachers, how far do we want to take it as a board? How far do we want to take it uh, from this level uh, in, in enforcing this? I, I, think an I, th I think working towards a policy, working towards a, toward a set of practices and, and making sure that we garner as much buy-in as we possibly can by advertising and discussing the, the fears that we have with increased cell phone use among adolescents and, and how it disrupts the school day are all very important factors to getting good buy-in. At the end of the day, uh, it's still going to be a challenge. It's still, and I would probably venture to say every superintendent I've spoken to, this isn't just a King George challenge. This is a challenge everywhere. This is a societal challenge. It's not just a school challenge. It's one that people are struggling with. Uh, we're all part of this experience. This, this, is, this is something that has come uh, alive in our generation. We've learned the benefits of it. And now we're appreciating and trying to understand the drawbacks of it. Trying to reel that back in is going to be a challenge no matter how we roll this out. So how do we want to respond to that? I think encouraging, educating, and trying to help our educators by supporting them is going to be the most effective approach for moving forward. I think anything punitive, anything where we're talking about firing or anything of that nature is, is going to be uh, difficult to enforce. And... Um, difficult for our school division moving forward. Hey, Mr. Frank, the very thing that you were saying, I think is the biggest problem is I think if you were to say that there, it's just prohibited, that puts a massive burden on the teacher. It's the very problem. I'm personally, I, I've experienced that the burden on the teacher. Now, some teachers, no problem. They've been doing it. They got processes. It's done. But other teachers, the burden is don't do this, Mr. Bush, because I don't want to die on that hill. Well, I have reached out to Hopewell High School. I've talked to Dr. Boyd about this. Uh, they are, will welcome us there to see their school. They say that this is working for them, and it's working for them using the yonder bags. Where did you say? I'm sorry. Hopewell. That's where I graduated, and I can tell you that's not that wasn't an easy school. I didn't graduate from Hopewell, but the next county over. And Hopewell wasn't known to have, like, the best schools, so they really— but it's, it's apparently working for them. Uh, it did not work at first because they didn't have all the teacher buy-in. Then they got all the teacher buy-in. And now the assistant principal who I talked to by the name of Jerry McCoy uh, says it's working well. I recommend that we go down and we check it out before, I mean, we can talk about the rest of this policy, but before we print anything up, we go down and we talk to these people and see what, and or, and, even have him come here to talk to our teachers later on. What's the name of this? This is what we're going to do. School. Hope with, well, where, where is that? Richmond. It's, it's in, uh, it's past Chesterfield it's in Colonial Heights area, Petersburg. Have you looked up a copy of their policy by chance? No, I did not. I just yeah, spoke I like, with them. Yeah. Because I mean, my, my general thoughts on this, I read it and it, I mean, just to sum it up, basically, it seems like it just says administrators just do whatever you think's best. Yeah. And I'm wondering, how's that different than what we're doing right now? It seems like it's, it's, it's the same thing we're doing. Yeah. That's, that's the point. That's where the whole meat of this whole discussion is, is in that one sentence. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, I think we're all in agreement with you, Mr. Frank. It's just we want to make it work. Oh, yeah, I, I absolutely. If there is a school that has made this work. Yeah, I'd love, you know, at the beginning, sure, it's going to be difficult no matter what we do. But I'm in total agreement. So let's, let's, Davis, go ahead. There's a couple schools. That, what was the school at the VSBA event that they? Charles County. Yeah, Charles County is doing it where they, what do they, they don't use phones during the day. They're all set in that general area down there. I, I can reach out to Hopewell and uh, see if we can set up something. I don't know that we could all go uh, given. Oh, you could go. Or... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Mm -hmm. But if, if you could go and take a couple of the teachers from the high school and the middle school with you, uh, so that, you know, that would be great. I'll, I'll take a look at it. It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Cause I think Mr. Frank, I think this whole board, obviously this is one of our goals. We all want to do that. It's just that I would hate to pass a policy that is going to not be followed. You know what I mean? That's my fear. And if we can get some glean, some other ideas from other schools, that's made it work. That's great. Uh, the last paragraph. Uh, elementary, middle and high school students may use portable communication devices before or after the instructional day, as long as such communication devices are not activated inside school board buildings, not activated inside school board buildings during the instructional day. So I added in during the instructional day there. And then I, then I added in another part for students with medical needs. For students with medical needs, communication devices may be used with approval from building administrations. We did um, walk the high school and that was one of the concerns with some of the children or the students with medical issues that might need their cell phones mm -hmm. to take their, what was oh, it? The, the blood, sugar. blood sugar. Things like that, yeah. It's a good point. They have to have their cell phone to be able to do that, right? Yeah. It's some if there's yeah. All right. Well, let's definitely. We're not approving anything tonight, obviously. Um, if you would, um, oh, I didn't send this to you, Doctor Boyd. I'm sorry. I have it. Oh, do you? Okay. Mm -hmm. What he? Yes, I got it. I did send it to you. Okay. Well, I mean, sorry, Mr. Frank sent it. I just helped him send it. Sorry. Yeah. Let's look at that, and then maybe visit the school, and let's come back to this. Um at uh, the next board meeting if we can, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Mr. Frank. Those are some great ideas. And thank you, Dr. Boyd, for your work on this. This is not an easy topic. We want to definitely take our time to make sure that we're going to pass something that will, um, will, be, it will work. And if there are other schools that are making it work, I think that's a great idea. All right, is that the last? One, got two, two more. more. Two more. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at Mr. Frank's and I'm saying, wait, there's nothing left. <laughs> All right, KBA-E, is that right? Mm -hmm. yep. KBA-E, correct. We are. So this again is just in reflection of a change on the state level. And if you turn to, I think it's page four, it talks about uh, how charges are determined for FOIA requests. I thought we already had something like this in place. What? I think this is an update to uh, changes some of the figures. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. So a question I had, it's not addressed here. So this money just goes in the general fund or what happens to this money when it's collected? I think it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, just goes into our, our general fund. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions about this? I think this is just an update for um, the cost of things. All right, well, let's make this into a motion too, if we can, unless there's more questions. I move that we approve policy KBA-E. I second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye, it's passed. It's but in retrospect, approved. Maybe not know offhand, Dr. Boyd, but you know, dash R means regulation, any idea what dash E is? Exhibit. Exhibit. Thank you. Thanks. All right, policy KF. Uh, this again is just a cross-reference update. Okay. Policy and cross-reference right. updates. From JFC-R to JFC student code of conduct. Okay, mm. or student conduct. All right, same thing. If there's no discussion, let's make this into a motion. I move we approve policy KF as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. It's done. All right, this last one has to do with me. Well, and Dr. Boyd, but if you would, um, school board members, if you would open up that last one, last item there, it um, has the superintendent formative assessment performance report. I sent you all copies of that. Um, you can look at that, this is what we did last year, and this is a formative. In other words, this is not his evaluation. This is kind of giving him an idea of where he stands up to this point in the year. 
Um, and so this is a very kind of loose thing, but it provides at least a form for you to think about, you know, what is he accomplishing? And first of all, the uh, four, um, the, taken from the four goals of our strategic plan, and then it's also taken from VSBA's eight standards for the superintendent evaluations. In other words, all of these will be reflected in his, what we call his summative, in other words, at the end of the year. But we need to have a formative kind of giving Dr. Boyd an idea of how do we feel he's doing up to date, and then recommendations for uh, areas of growth and commendations. So ideally, you would not have to fill out, board members, I'm talking to you now, you would not have to fill out every comment in every one of these, but you can fill out some of them, um, all of them, and whatever you'd like, and then you'd bring it to our meeting, which is uh, referenced on the next, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, when to bring it, but basically, I believe it's the 24th of April. You would bring it on the 24th of April, we'd go into closed session, and then we would talk to Dr. Boyd about how we feel he's doing up to this point and we would use this form. And then you would sign it and eventually give it to him, uh, but it is just a formative. Okay, thoughts? So is there any difference from previous years that we added the strategic goals to this? Is that the only change? Well, last year, no, last year I did the same one. It was exactly the same. Okay, so why is it being presented? Well, because <laughs> I want, it's being presented because I want to see, did you want, this is a new board, okay? If we, if we were all the same as last year, I wouldn't have done it. But this is new people on the board. They haven't ever seen this before. And did you want to make recommendations to change some of these things? Did you want to do it differently? Because we don't have to do the formative in this way. You can do the formative in many different ways. I just chose this last year. And I figured it's an easy way to do it. So let's do it this year because we got a lot going on. So that's okay. the reason. Okay. Looks fine. Yeah. I'm fine. Mr. Frank and Ms. Ms. Davis had never seen anything like this before, so I figured I'd show it to them. Okay, so it's it's fine that we use this form? I do, just in general, I don't know, have a specific recommendation or idea to improve it, but a lot of these things are pretty pretty high level. It's not stuff that you necessarily are able to observe directly, so it's pretty hard to comment on some stuff. You almost need some survey results to fill a lot of this in, which we won't that's have why formative. That's why it's formative. We cannot do all these things, you're right. So you just comment on those things that you have seen that he's done up to this point. Because you're right, we don't have a lot of that information yet, which we will have on a summative. So there, like last year, I didn't, there was a couple of these I didn't fill out because I'm thinking, oh, I haven't seen enough to know that yet. And that's okay. This is like a mid-year. Right. Like a mid-year for us. Right. Right through. And we don't have, I'm just saying, I don't think we have information to do a lot of it. Like this, a lot of this is more familiar, more appropriate for the end of the year. Correct. And, and I think we started doing some surveys, but I, that, I don't know if we're going to get around to it this year, but eventually I would like to set up some more formal surveys to help inform the, the evaluation. We are going to talk about that. You'll see in this next okay. form, I have the timeline. You'll see where. Okay. But so as far as this, is this all right for a formative board? We don't necessarily need to have a vote on this. But if it's acceptable, then if you would fill this out on your own time, either you can send it to me if you want or just bring it with you on the 24th, either one. Is that agreeable? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on into the very bottom of this. You'll see a um, superintendent's evaluation timeline. These are suggestions. These obviously a lot of things can happen during the year. These may change, these dates may change slightly, but at least it gives you an idea, especially the two new board members, an idea of what his, this is the summative now in preparation for all that. So you can see the superintendent then will begin to submit his year's goals by the middle of next month. And he'll do that um, uh, during a meeting, the public meeting. I don't know, is that an actual board member date? I mean, excuse me, is that a date for a board meeting? I can't remember. What's it, the 15th? Yeah. I don't believe so. All right, well anyway then, so he'll submit those to us uh, via email and then we can, any kind of comment that we have about those. Um, and then the superintendent begins documentation or portfolio. We discussed this last year and we agreed that it would be a good thing for him to complete, especially in reference to his summative at the end of the year. And then the formative completed, this is what we were just talking about on the 24th, we'll complete this formative that we just discussed. And then I will provide a process of the rest of the year's timeline on May the 6th. And that's, um, and Mr. Rolls, to your um, comment, and we'll talk about some of these surveys at that point, okay? 
and I'll also try to send you some other emails of what we did last year and so on. Um, and then the surveys will be made and distributed to all the stakeholders on May 22nd. And again, like Mr. Roll said, we'll probably tweak some of those and we'll talk about those in a board meeting. Um, and then the self-evaluation and turned into the board. This is Dr. Boyd's self-evaluation. He'll turn that in by August. And then the student standard performance. This is where we get the uh, all of the results. So like you were referring to Mr. Rolls um, by um, the, so hopefully we'll get them by August 19th. I don't know whether we will or not. Dr. Boyd, should we have those by the end of the summer, the results, the SOLs and that? Mm, by which date did you say? August by 19th? August 19th. Maybe a little early. I think it's more. In the Again, September. these are just, these aren't exact dates. September-ish. Yeah, so it may be in September. I think that's what happened last year too. All documentation from the superintendent to the board. This is just your pieces, Dr. Boyd, in terms of your, um, any documentation, the portfolio and those kinds of things. In the board meeting on September 9th, we will include a discussion of the summative process and copies of all related documents on the 9th of September. And then a complete summative from all the school board members. That means us, we will fill something out. And then the final scores, it's because all the summative is scored, um, at least it was last year, and compiled and discussed at a board meeting on October the 16th. And then the annual final superintendent's evaluation given to the superintendent October 28th. But if you look above, I said that uh, this would be completed by November 30th, because knowing that there's going to be a lot of these dates for various reasons, we won't be able to fulfill. This is just giving us an idea generally that um, of the kinds of things that will help keep me as the board chair accountable and to be reporting to you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. On July 22nd, surveys made and, and distributed. Yes. Most teachers will be gone then. It's summer break for them. I mean, we still have staff there and and uh, year employees or 245 day employees are there, but most teachers or a lot of teachers will not be available. It's true. What did we do last year? I think we had it done by the end of the school year last year. Do we have it done by the end of the school year? All right. Then we will change that. Then the last day of um, then it should be done in May sometime. All right, that's a good point. I'll change that. Anything else? Again, these dates are very general. Those are the big areas that we need to cover. The dates will change, and I will change it. Thank you. You're right. I didn't think about that, but you're absolutely right. I think that's probably the date when hopefully we'll compile all the information. <laughs> All right, that's it. So what are we saying must be completed by November 30th? Everything, his total evaluation will be completed by November 30th. Hopefully we'll do it by October, but at the latest November. I think even in our I think phone we, calls, it says about the second before the end of the year, the second board meeting before the end of the year or something like that. Yeah, I think when you look at that, I think it, there's some conflict somewhere, either there and in, in, in between that and the soups contract. Yeah, I don't need to go look at that again. Okay. You think it's the end of the calendar year? Well, I, yeah, I think in our norms and protocols, we actually make a mention about the superintendent's evaluation is due by, it's definitely before the end of the year. I was thinking maybe it said fiscal year even. No, I think it was calendar year. Yeah. Okay, this is general stuff. At least it gives you an idea. We're moving forward with this right now. This, uh, the uh, formative was the primary thing that we're agreed with on the 24th. Okay. Okay. All right. Next, we'll have information items, committee reports. Ms. Hoover. So we haven't, have not had an opportunity to report. Um, on February 22nd, there was a technology advisory committee, which I missed due to illness. Ms. Half was gracious enough to pass along her notes to me. Um, we have a wonderful team of parents and staff that attend these meetings and there's issues going on like Apple watches in classrooms, et cetera. Um, but I will say that the biggest takeaway for me was personally when I went to the school board office and I was buzzed in and didn't need to have somebody come to the, to the door and let me in. That was kind of a cool thing. But, um, anyway, uh, Ms. Haft is, is, uh, tracking like security grants and radios for the schools and those kinds of things. And um, 
I just appreciate all she does to keep us up to date and running and even sitting here tonight because somebody's not here. I appreciate you. Um, and I will promise to make the next meeting. You guys didn't want my germs at the last one. Um, and then this week I attended the gifted and talented uh, committee meeting at the school board office. And um, that's also an awesome group of parents and staff. Um, they have spoken to Dr. Boyd about a, an additional position, which he's aware of. Um, and the summer enrichment program is a go this year. We're gonna have to look into how we're gonna fund that next year because I guess this year is the last year that it was funded by the for funds or something. Yeah, something like that. Um, we also got to visit the Parent Resource Center that Dr. Howard uh, hosted that little tour. And I wanna give that a plug because um, that's a, a resource center for all community members. I have a little flyer here that I brought along. Um, it's it's just a, a great opportunity for even homeschool parents if they if they need resources. Um, please go visit the school board office. Um, and then Ms. Hill reported that there was testing and interviews completed for Governor's School, and they have. 21 students for the uh, Commonwealth School, seven students accepted to Chesapeake Bay, and eight of our students will be attending the Fredericksburg Regional Governor School Summer Program. And a plug for Sea uh, Perch sponsors at King George Middle School because the competition is in April and we don't have any sponsor. So anybody that's interested in that, please reach out. Um, we will have a back to school night for the gifted and talents and service services in September on the 18th. And teachers are gonna plan activities for kids and families and a parent information session will also be available. Um, we're discussing goals and needs for next year. Um, and there are suggestions for a book study and or after school program for kids who still want more. That's all I got. Good, thank you, Ms. Hoover. Mr. Rawls. I just had a Commonwealth Governor School uh, meeting last week. And the big news there is that we decided after 20 some years, Spotsylvania stepped back from being the fiscal agent and Stafford has taken over July 1st. We still need a, um, a counselor, a CGS counselor. We had posted that previously and we're gonna repost it. And, but I think it's a better time of year to post it now. So we should probably get lots of applicants and hopefully get somebody, uh, I think we probably need to wait for the new fiscal agents to take over July 1st to actually offer them a contract, but hopefully shortly thereafter, we'll have a counselor again for CGS. That's all. All right, good. Ms. Davis? Um, for the Chesapeake Bay Governor School, we finalized our budget, but we, we had a very short meeting last week and it was just basically approving new hires and just finalizing all the budget and approving it. It was very short actually. So um, I think, and I'm new at this too, so I'm trying to learn everything and not taking everything in because it's also new, but I will future have more of what's going on with the you know students and stuff. Good, thank you. Mr. Frank? Well, first I'd like to thank all the teachers out there for everything that you do without you, we could not. Uh, do what we do or, or, you know, educate our students. So I definitely want to thank uh, all the teachers out there. Uh, there was a lot of them here tonight uh, representing the CTE. Uh, those are always special. Uh, I want to thank- yeah, Mr. People. Frank, this is, are you doing board comments now? This is all committee right. report. Board comments will come in a minute. I, I've been to a lot of meetings and I've visited to schools, all the schools except for one, some of them more than once. Um, it's gonna let you come back around. Okay, yeah. Did you have any no, committee reports? I made a couple of committee meetings. Uh, I'm not gonna, you know, take up the time. Uh, the first one was um, safety. There was 23 people scheduled to be there. There were three people there. Uh, the other was the code of conduct, which was a, a good meeting. Okay. Run, run well. Thank you. And I'm sorry for the confusion. We'll have board, no, no. board comments. Okay. I have a couple committee reports. Um, one is that I, <clears throat> Dr. Boyd and I attended an ATI or lab school meeting the end of last month. And I think that came 
after our board meeting? I think it did. I think it did, because there's another committee meeting for the ATI school in um, Stafford, that's that new school that you saw in the budget, where we have seven students that will be, have been accepted and will be starting this new school. And uh, last month we had more discussions. She is uh, beginning to, in the hiring process, which is wonderful. Um, and um, I'm, each time I go, I feel a little more confident of the preparation, because again, this is not gonna start until next semester but there's a lot to do between now and then, and she seems to be covering most of those bases. We've had, uh, we did have, was it Orange County that joins us? Orange. Um, yeah, the Orange uh, schools joined us. So we have another division that's part of it, which is very good because the more divisions that we can have to be part of this, the more that it will reflect um, a larger community, and that also affects the grants that we get. Um, and there was a concern, uh, Spotsylvania had dropped out, and um, so that ended up um, with an opening for more students and Orange took up some of those. And what Orange didn't take up, um, Stafford agreed to fill some of those positions. Again, this next year, they're only supposed to be filling approximately 100 positions. And I think they were at 85, does that sound right? Sounds right. Mm -hmm. um, of that 100, which is very good. So things are progressing. And uh, obviously when this starts uh, sometime in September, there'll be a whole lot to re more to report. Um, I have to apologize, the um, Special Education Advisory Committee, they've had two meetings, one of them was in January, and because of the death of my son, there were situations and I wasn't able to attend. And then the one on Wednesday, last Wednesday, I was invited, uh, again, related to my son's uh, passing, my grandson invited me to see his track meet, and that was the first I had to go. I uh, hope everybody understands. And I, I called Miss um, Howard, or I contacted Miss Howard and told her, and she said, absolutely, it's fine. She sent me the notes here, and uh, I will tell you the uh, some of the things that happened, and Miss Hoover mentioned one of them, and that was the family resource night that she was in charge of, was held on March the 6th. And again, it was very good and successful. They did have recommend recommendations for next year. One is to consider the school calendar and other events being held in the same week. That, the uh, problems with scheduling things is always an issue, especially um, in King George. We do a good job with so many different events going on. And also to consider an alternative, an alter alternate location in the building um, that will handle therapy dogs, which I think is kind of interesting. And uh, the people who are medically cannot uh, be around dogs. You kind of have both of those issues. And so they're looking at uh, what they can do with that. Then also consider asking for the event to be publicized through the school website um, scrolls in order to get more information out to the people. I'm sure that's probably already being done. That's in Amanda, or Ms. Higgins court. <laughs> All right, new business. Miss um, Neamey is working with Amanda Higgins to create a website for the Parent Teacher Resource Center, same thing. And um, I don't know how it's going, but um, my experience with Ms. Higgins is she's very resourceful and very good, and that will probably look wonderful. But anyway, she's developing a website and that uh, will be linked to the division website for helping with that anyway. Uh, Ms. Howard and Ms. Nimi are working on a grant to fund the additional resources for the PTRC. What does PTRC stand for? Parent, Teacher, Resource, Resource Center. Thank you. Um, and so they're working on getting more funds for that. And Ms. Howard, Dr. Howard presented an annual plan for the 24-25 school year. And it was explained that these funds would come from the state and is not part of the local process. The majority of the funding is used for staffing and the amounts presented are based on historical data. The plan will be presented to the school board um, on May the 8th. Or excuse me, the next meeting is May the 8th. But she will be presenting those, um, the plan for staffing to us sometime before the end of the year. And our next meeting is May the 8th. All right, and next on the agenda, it has to do a preschool update. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, Ms. Higgins, if you could pull that up. So I, I think uh, it would be a good time to just talk briefly and update uh, our board. Uh, we've had some, some change in our board and also some change in the Board of Supervisors as, as far as um, the makeup of both of those boards. So I think as this has been a project that has been going on for some time now, uh, just updating the board and letting them know uh, where we've been, uh, where we are, and, and where we intend to go with the King George Preschool project. So uh, just to, to put things in perspective, taking a look at uh, the current preschool building, it does house three of our uh, special, or excuse me, our preschool programs. 
We have the early uh, childhood special education program. Some of the students in that program are as young as two years old. Uh, we have VPI, which is the Virginia Preschool Initiative. Uh, we also have Head Start, uh, which is not listed up there. Uh, and we also have a peer model program where students that do not have disabilities partner with uh, students that do have disabilities and participate in preschool through that way. All in all, all of those programs service about 135 uh, students currently in King George County. Just to put that in perspective uh, with the new building that uh, has been proposed through the feasibility study, the feasibility study uh, building that was proposed is of about for about 260 uh, students in whole. Uh, and we've got some other ideas on programmatic needs and things of that nature uh, as it pertains to the, to the preschool and our other elementary uh, buildings across the county. Next slide. So I'm just gonna quickly show you uh, the condition of, of that existing building. And I'm just gonna preface it by saying this, I can promise you that anything I can say or any picture that you look at tonight will not give the justice that building deserves. If you want, if any school board member, if any board of supervisors member, or quite frankly, anybody in the county that wants to come by and uh, tour that building, uh, words cannot give it justice. I know Mr. Yeah. Frank went to the to uh, the preschool today and I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I'm pretty sure you can confirm that. Oh yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, next slide. You see the cornerstone there was from 1935. That's that's how old uh, the the building is, and, and it had Franklin D. Roosevelt on it. Uh, so we'll start with the roof. The roof has a ton of of uh, water damage, and as a result, probably uh, mold issues. And and quite frequently, when we have even a light storm, uh, you, you can walk down the hallway of the preschool and, and it's a waterfall. There's, there's water all over the place, which is obviously a safety issue uh, amongst other things. Next slide. Uh, this is the exterior of the building. A lot of Band-Aids have been put on this building. In fact, I was told one time by Gary Clift, who is our maintenance director, that at one time this building was condemned uh, and then opened back up to serve uh, as a preschool for, uh, due to the absence of any other uh, appropriate facility. But you see here some of these Band-Aids you see the stucco around the windows. Uh, what, what on the left hand side? That stucco is covering old, uh, existing windows. So the envelope of the building is very porous. There's a ton of holes uh, and, and a lot of, uh, you know, outside heat, outside uh, cold air comes in and out of the building pretty freely. Uh, the building was not climate controlled to begin with. So you'll see things like window AC units. Uh, placed on the outside of the building. You'll also see like heating units and things of that nature in the bathrooms so that the pipes don't freeze. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is These are nicer parts of the building. So these are the interior walls of the uh, preschool building. Uh, you see they are stucco uh, type walls. You can literally poke your finger right through these walls. In many places, uh, they poke right to the exterior of the building. So that bottom right hand uh, picture, that's in that front left hand room, uh, right as you walk into the building, some call it the library. Uh, I think you said it was the an office. English room yeah. or an office at one time. Uh, that stucco there is like literally melting off the wall. And I think there's spots that you can actually see through to the exterior of the building there. Next slide. Uh, again, these are aftermarket, after the fact, uh, electric he heaters that are placed in the bathrooms. These are placed in the bathrooms because we don't want the pipes to freeze. Uh, so so the, they're not climate controlled or they were not climate controlled. And now we're attempting to um, just provide enough heat in the facility so that uh, the, the, the pipes don't end up freezing and bursting. On the right hand side, uh, if you if again, if you want to ever take a tour, you know, the new Ghostbusters movie is coming out. Uh, so this this fire alarm really looks like something out of the Ghostbusters circa 1960 uh, that though, there's huge. I mean, fuses that are that are the sizes of um, I, I don't even know how to describe them. They're, they're larger fuses than I've ever seen before. They're outdated. You cannot uh, purchase them anymore. And the fire alarm, uh, which I think is a huge safety issue, does not have a dialer. Uh, 
Uh, so if the building, the the entire the wood building that has a very outdated electrical system caught on fire, uh, it would not dial like all of our other buildings do. The fire, uh, uh, the fire department, we would have to actually make that that call um, on our own, assuming we could. Next slide. So again, uh, as we work our way to the end, and this was one of the initial presentations we made. Uh, again, my words cannot provide justice to the to the deteriorating quality of that building. Our most vulnerable learners, our most vulnerable uh, children in this entire school division, uh, students that have severe special ed needs, uh, respiratory needs, uh, you name it, very severe special education uh, needs, uh, currently attend school in this building uh, day in and day out. So as uh, we work towards and work through this process, uh, I, I think you'll see in, in the next portion of this presentation, the feasibility study, the initial feasibility study, and the expanded feasibility study. We do have options, uh, but I would say that one of the options right now is, is not waiting. We, we, in my opinion, and anyone that, that wants to doubt this opinion, please come by and take a look at this building. We don't have the option to wait. This building is way past due to be condemned. Anybody that's visited it or anybody that has a historical knowledge of this community is ready to level this building. We really need to get children and um, staff out of this building as soon as we possibly can. Next slide. I think that's the end of that slide. And then if we took a look at the feasibility study, now we're gonna move forward a little bit. And again, what we did was uh, early on in this process, in cooperation with the Board of Supervisors uh, and through the CIP process, we conducted a feasibility study. And it's important to understand what a feasibility study, a feasibility study is just to see whether or not we have options that are feasible for a new preschool building. This is not a design uh, study. This is not architectural work. This is not engineering. That's where we will be hopefully. But right now, the feasibility study simply see, simply assesses whether or not that building is worth doing anything to, whether or not we have another location to consider for the preschool, and what options we have programmatically within the school division that we should consider or that we consider feasible for the preschool moving forward. So in this feasibility study, it looked at uh, the existing conditions of the building, which again is kind of what I just went through, uh, but provides more uh, pictures of, of many of the things that we just looked at in the last presentation. The next section looked at the programmatic needs of the existing preschool. So again, this took a look at uh, expected um, or state recommended class sizes, state recommended common spaces like gymnasiums, uh, office space, uh, bathroom spaces, all of the things that are required for a building. And we took into consideration the current program programmatic needs of the building and also what potentially could be an expansion of our preschool program uh, across the county. So you can see there, there is um, the common things you see with, within a, uh, uh, any school building. It's 14 classrooms, it's some special, uh, some, uh, special education classrooms, some specials classrooms listed as art there. You have an administration wing, a gymnasium, and then your um, you know, kind of miscellaneous space, your building service spaces, uh, food service, and, and so forth. Uh, the next slide goes into, or the next section of this goes into some options. And again, uh, it's important for us to not take a look at these options and consider them uh, to any level of detail. We're not to the detail stage of the preschool project yet. So this is simply a feasibility study. What type of building would we need to address the programmatic needs that currently exist or, we in, or, or that we could expand uh, towards in the future? So this building is not to spec, it's not to design or anything of that nature. It's just to show uh, what a preschool could look like um, in very rudimentary terms. I spoke with 
Uh, Stephen Hayes, uh, Stephen Halsey today, he's the architect for Mosley who's responsible uh, for this. He says our next steps uh, moving forward are much more specific. The feasibility study is just general 30,000 foot view of what I already mentioned, our options, our programmatic needs, and consideration for uh, the preschool moving forward. If you remember, uh, the Board of Supervisors then directed Mosley to go back and do a more expanded feasibility study. <clears throat> That's when we took a look at that 57 acre parcel behind the 50, 50 47. 47? Okay, 47 acre parcel, thank you. Uh, behind the, yeah, you're right, 47 acre parcel behind the uh, existing middle school and existing high school to consider um, an expansion of services. So that expansion considered a fourth elementary school. The fourth elementary school on the expanded study would sit right on the footprint of the existing, or the, the middle school that, uh, the, the former middle school. The, the preschool would be down in this, you can see it in this diagram here, down on the right-hand side of the uh, property there. There's very little uh, flat area in that property there. Uh, a lot of wetlands, a lot of uh, kind of peaks and valleys. So there's really about two quality places there to put buildings. Uh, the, the light yellow area in the up, upper left-hand corner is a proposed fourth elementary school that's on the footprint of the former middle school. And then down towards the middle of the graphic is the proposed preschool uh, towards the back right-hand side of that property. The expanded feasibility study does include a second floor of that preschool so that we could close the school board office over uh, in, in that outdated building that we currently reside in. And the final thing in the expanded feasibility study is to include an inter-campus traffic pattern so that uh, into the future, uh, if we had a fourth, element, uh, fourth elementary school, preschool, school board office, uh, all of those facilities would be co connected to also the existing middle school and existing high school via a traffic pattern so that our school buses and our school traffic would be off of that uh, 206 uh, and, and Route 3 uh, intersection, which we all know is, is a very hectic intersection, especially when school is in session. So that's where we are with the feasibility study right now. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I can uh, certainly attempt to address them. Where we are uh, in terms of the funding, uh, and I don't wanna speak um, incorrectly, the Board of Supervisors, the former Board of Supervisors uh, approved, I believe, two bonds, uh, the first of which was a $25 million, bond, $25 million bond. I think that was supposed to be for the fire station and whatever the remainder of that bond that was left was supposed to cover the initial cost associated with the preschool, which would have likely been the uh, engineering design and, and architectural design for the preschool. And then that second bond would have covered the, the building of the preschool. The cost estimate of the preschool uh, on the front end from the Mosley study was $27 million. And so I can stop there for any questions or any other considerations. I spoke are. with Jackie Fish today from the county to get an update on the school. And she told me that the bond for 26 or $27 million was for both. Not, I didn't hear two bonds. I heard one bond. It is for two bonds. Um, the second bond amount. I believe they were both of the same amount. I think they were both of $27 million. Okay. It, um, the first one was to be like I said, partially for the fire department, any remainder was for the initial part of the preschool, and then there was a second bond as well. Mm -hmm. Has the second bond has been approved? You sure? I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you. I know the first one was approved, yeah. sure. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I literally talked to her today and she, all she told me was, I said, are you sure that, that 27 million is for both the firehouse and the preschool? And she said, yes. I'm sure it's two bonds. I don't know if the second bond has been approved yet or not, okay. but I'm sure it's two bonds. 
I think he's right, but I don't know if the second one. Yeah, I mean, the preschool itself is on the order of 27 million, so. I know that's what I was concerned yeah. when I was hearing. I was like. Mm -hmm. And it's like the board, are we locked into a preschool? I mean, what I'm saying is, what's a, Kathy had an idea of we build a, another elementary school, mm -hmm. and that would give us four elementary schools. In each elementary school, we could put four classrooms for preschool and that'll get us up to our 50, actually 16 rooms well we're looking for 15 uh, but it'll take care of, of 260 students that way is that a possibility i mean i know that would put the school board out in the street for a little while or in bad conditions for a little while longer but it would definitely take care of our uh more of our students preschool students yeah, so I can't speak specifically to the to to where that places the, you know, the bond situation and the funding. Uh, I, I don't know the answers to that to that question. In terms of uh, where we are in the process of the feasibility study versus the design of any new building, we are very much at a pivotal pivotal point right now where we still can consider other options. Uh, we can consider a fourth elementary school. It would obviously be, and there is a cost estimate. I want to say it was in the ballpark of forty million uh, for an for a fourth elementary school as opposed to a preschool. Um, but programmatically, could we make that work? Yes, we could make that work. We could, we could if we built a fourth. We couldn't make it work without a fourth elementary school. We would have to have a fourth elementary school so that we could uh, free up some space. Uh, we would have to we would have to adjust attendance zones and do a number of other things uh, so that we could free up some space. It would be a lot of work. It would be a more expensive option. I'll just be honest on the front end, uh, but it would get us our fourth elementary school, and we could uh, divide our preschool uh, programs up amongst those uh, uh, four elementary schools. So that that's certainly an option. The existing preschool that has already been designed is certainly an option. And I'll just say again, I, I think, I just can't stress enough that we don't really have any time to waste. I, I think something has to be decided. So with these feasibility studies, was there any kind of like a traffic study done? Because I wonder about having so many, close, so many schools so close to each other and what that might do to the traffic in the area. Well, uh, to be honest with you, we haven't done a traffic study for the fourth elementary school yet, but um, th those schools right now are in close proximity to each other. I mean, they're really not the existing preschool, the existing school board office, the high school, the middle, the middle school, all of those are, uh, they'll end up being just about the same distance apart uh, as they are right now. I do know that, um, yeah, I guess two things, observations. One is um, I think the idea of building a fourth elementary is really something if we could consider. However, like Mr. Frank said, and I think there's also a cost of even the community here, we said we've been really pushing for the new preschool and now all of a sudden we're saying, okay, we're gonna change that. We're gonna build a fourth elementary. A lot of people would say, yay, and others are gonna go, well, that means we're probably another year out. Yeah. There is a real fear. Uh, I do think that might be a, a, even a better idea but I think we got to gather some information and I don't know what the rest of the board feels, but um, I like the idea of maybe not building the, the preschool, but building this fourth elementary, <clears throat> but there's got to be a lot of discussions and preliminary work. What does the board feel about Dr. Boyd sort of beginning that discussion with the preschool and some of the other administrators at the elementary schools and what that might look like? I, I think programmatically, that's not a huge shift for us. I, I think it, it would probably be very beneficial if we want to move this project forward in our board and the board of supervisors having a, a dialogue yeah, right. uh, and figuring out where they are and what they're comfortable with and, and what, and, and again, maybe that meeting can take place at the preschool. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I think... I think what's absent right now uh, in a lot of this debate is is a real appreciation for the conditions of that building. All right, let me contact um, the Board of Supervisors, the Chairman and the Vice Chairman, and see if we can set something up to have a dialogue about this or even a work session, because we can't wait. I agree totally. In fact, I'm worried there's gonna be a lawsuit. Um, this is just, it's, it's, it's not good for our younger kids to even be there. My question is, if we're gonna build a new building, 
whichever building is going to take about the same amount of time, right? We just have to decide and move forward. I think so. I mean, other than maybe the consideration of the size differences of the building, but yeah, as far as and again, I can't speak to, to the funding and the, and the bond side of that. I don't know how that changes, if at all. That would be more of a county question. But to your point, yeah, starting, to, starting a building and building a building is what needs to happen right now so that we but can I, do that. I do think the size of the elementary, though, would be considerably larger than the preschool, and it probably would take, I'm guessing, another six months for that size. I just, having been through this a few times, I think building a larger school building will take a little more time than just building a smaller one. But we need to get started with something, that's for sure. Yeah, well, we have two of our elementary schools that are at capacity now, so we're going to have to have an elementary school. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah, yeah. We, may, we talked about that a lot last year. You were here. When we... We, we've got a little space in King George Elementary School right now, not enough to house all of the programs that we have in our in our preschool program. And, and I think it's important to mention, too, the, the concept of expanding. Uh, if we can get there. And, and again, that takes that there's a lot of if ands and buts between now and then. But I, I can tell you, you know, research will tell you that a, a comprehensive preschool program in a community has a huge benefit on the educational outcomes for students. Yes, it does. I mean, anytime anyone learns anything new, that learning curve on the front is, is the steepest and you make the greatest gain. So if you have a comprehensive preschool program where our kids are learning school routine and the basic understanding of, of how to operate in a school, it has huge ramifications Absolutely. for the entire school division in Absolutely. the entire county. Yeah. And from what I saw today and what you and I saw when we went back a couple months ago at the preschool, one of those tiles falls on a kid and on a, one of those little kids that are in there, it's going to cost us millions and millions. Yeah, of that's, bucks. What I, that's what that's my point. Yeah, exactly. And and I would just add this in in conclusion: just maintaining that building right now is going to cost us millions. I mean, it's not like that's a free option for us right now to be in that building. Just for us to be able to make it hospitable to be in. And to continue to update it to, to, like you said, avoid lawsuits and things of that nature, it's going to cost millions in itself just through the CIP process of, of trying to get that bill, which nobody in this community wants to spend money on, on that building right now. All right, if it's all right with the board, then I will contact the uh, chairman of the Board of Supervisors and Vice Chair and try to set up a joint meeting to specifically talk about it. I love the idea of the meeting in the preschool. I don't know how that'll work, but I love that idea. I think um, I want to tell you that I think your first step is very important and, and actually key is letting them, I don't, because it has a friend, this is pretty much a new board, well, three out of five, and I don't think they actually know how bad it is. And we, as a board, haven't been presented it as we should probably have. And I think maybe it's detrimental that they go to this, that school and see it on hand for themselves. We'd be happy to host it there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great idea. idea. We'll do it. Well, we'll try to do it. I'll let the board know. Um, be ready. I'll try to send you out an email and see what the response will be from the chair and vice chair. And um, maybe would you send me um, the recent pictures, that first part that you just, would you send them to me? That especially those recent pictures of that wall, especially with everything falling off. If you'd, if you'd email these those to me, I want to make that part of the discussion with the, the chair and the vice chair to have this joint meeting. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Yes, sir. All right, superintendent's report. Yeah, so I just wanted to cover a few good things. You know, sometimes we get caught in the monotony of, of uh, the day-to-day -day and, um, you know, because of our positions, we oftentimes focus uh, on the things that we need to fix and we don't take a good enough appreciation for many of the wonderful things that are going on in our school division as we've seen tonight with the CTE presentation. I just wanted to hit on a couple highlights from, from this past month alone. We had the STEAM night. Uh, at the high school, that was an unbelievable evening. A lot of folks came out, always a, a, a great affair. I think just the night before that or two nights before that, we had the foreign food market. That was amazing. Uh, all of the foreign language students uh, created food from, from different countries around the world. Uh, they purchased tickets, everyone purchased tickets to come in and um, I, I did an around the world tour of, of all the food that was available that evening. 
Uh, we all went to the VSBA uh, Regional School Board meeting where one of our students, Riley Williams, had won second place for the VSBA R contest. Uh, in the last month, we had three bands, our King George Middle School Symphonic, our King George High School Concert, and our Win Ensemble all perform admirably and, and get superior ratings at their competitions. Um, as you heard mentioned tonight, we had our first reverse career fair. Ms. Rinko is doing an amazing job of, as you heard this evening, of pulling so many wonderful resources together in the county. We also had our King George County School Job Fair, which was very uh, fruitful for us as well, and we ended up hiring some folks from that. Uh, and then, you know, one of the highlights is this is the second year now that the um, UMW Dahlgren has done the Innovation Challenge. Uh, the Innovation Challenges, Challenge takes, uh, they, they pull together teams from, I know our entire region, and I think maybe even a couple from over the bridge in Maryland, uh, private schools, public schools included, and they propose them with a challenge, and they have to design a solution to that challenge using AI, using robotics, using a number of different things, uh, and, and there's a prize associated with that. And this year, King George High School won that challenge uh, against all those other teams in, in the second year running. So very wonderful one thing, King George County Schools. Uh, we did a lot of wonderful things. I'm probably missing a few, uh, but just wanted to take a minute to say great job by the school division this past month and doing a number of great, great things. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Um, all right, we are now under the uh, board comments. And um, we'll start with our representatives, but I won't let our new representative. And our new representative of the middle school is Madison Clark. And Kayla Posey, I guess she had to leave a little bit early. And uh, I apologize. The board comments are at the end, and I apologize for that. Sometimes our meeting just go an hour and a half. Sometimes like this one, three and a half hours, and I apologize for that. But we'll let, I'm sorry, I forgot your name all of a sudden. Um, Connor Wheaton. Connor, yes. Connor, if you don't mind, why don't you as our high school rep go first and then we'll let Madison go after you. Yes, thank you. So with uh, students coming back from spring break last week, I haven't been able to fully figure out what has um, occurred over either spring break or the previous week, um, and only a little bit from the week previously. Um, two things uh, that happened last week and one that's currently still going on. Um, Friday last week, we had our variety show. We had, if I remember correctly, the number was around 32 participants that took place in the variety show and show that the school and the uh, public and community, their talent and what they can do. And there were three winners that received prizes at the end. And I've, I only remember the first place and third place winner, I do not remember the second place winner. Um, first place was Xander, Xander Aguilar, and third place was Oscar Matson. And his. Uh, he also had other, other members. I do not remember their names, however, though. Um, so that was last week. Um, right now, start, uh, that started back in the beginning of March. We have our prom tickets on sale. As of right now, currently, one pair, one ticket is fifty dollars, and and two pair, one two people, is now or is a hundred dollars for sale. Um, I highly encourage uh, seniors to go out and participate in their last prom, as this is something they'll. Um, this is the last thing you'll ever have the opportunity to do before going off to either higher ed, workforce, or military, wherever they go after high school. So I highly consider that for anyone out there. Um, besides from my report from the high school, um, as King George High School representative, student representative, um, I make sure that some of the best interests or the best interests of students at the high school are kept and are focused on. And right now I have some concerns about that. Um, one being the uh, cell phone policy. 
I remember from the February 12th meeting that I attended, um, I was going on, I was going to go on to comment about the cell phone policy um, where uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you said that the cell phone policy was currently being worked on, nothing has been decided. So I decided um, not to continue with my comments uh, as nothing has been decided. However, after over a month, um, I come back and I attend, attend regular meeting again after my two representatives attended. And I'm surprised to find out that there has already been, um, there's already been put together a, a potential move to prohibit cell phones almost seemingly permanently from the school, um, from the schools. Um, what I've seen from some students, both online and in person, there has been some disapproval and those who wish that phones aren't banned from our schools and aren't taken away from that opportunity to have them in our schools. Um, one thing that I am like that I am most definitely concerned is um, how how is students' um, opinion and also um, comments being used in this policy making of cell phones? Um, if students are if students' words are being um, are being used to help form this policy, if they're if the students are being advocated for this policy or if they're even being heard, that's one concern I have. And another one is how can the cell phone policy be fully enforced without hurting any student autonomy in our schools? Um, that's one that's another thing. I thought of before, that was actually something I just want to say at the last school board meeting I was I attended at on February 12th. And from there, I wish to see that students are heard for this policy and hear what they say should be or should not be done with this policy. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Uh, Madison Clark. Um, oh, I figured it out. Um, regarding the cell phone policy from the middle school, I've heard no positive things about it. And from all the opinions I've heard, because people were talking about it for like a week straight, is that permanently banning cell phones altogether is only going to take it away from students who are correctly using them. Students misusing their cell phones in the building are going to keep bringing them in and they're going to keep hiding them. If they're sneaking their phone in the bathroom, banning them isn't going to stop that. It's just going to take it away from students who are correctly using them and they get the benefits out of it. So I think I and most of the middle schoolers think that getting rid of it would be silly because it wouldn't get rid of your problem there. Maybe a couple students, but most people wouldn't follow that. Um, and then for just general things, on the topic of our bands, uh, the middle school is a blue ribbon school once again, because our symphonic band and our chorus receive superior on their assessments. Next Friday and Thursday, the 4th and 5th of April, I believe, uh, the middle school is putting on bedtime stories as told by our dad, who often mess them up. It's a play, and it's really great to see the middle school finding, finally getting a theater program again after all of these years, we put on a musical in November. So I think, just saying, you should probably come to it. Um, and then as I've like slowly become a representative and I've talked more with the school board, I've noticed a lot of kids were like, they only know Dr. Boyd off of our school board because they haven't seen um, any other members in our school. So I think in the middle school, if we had a day where some of the um, members were to come in like, and talk more with the students, which y'all might be doing, but I haven't heard the most from it because I don't think I've met anybody who's actually talked to you guys. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, I can tell you that, yeah, last semester, um, Ms. Hoover and I were there we, during lunch and we met with, we were there three or four hours 
We just went to the library. And, and we just went to the library and we I visited we and we saw you eating lunch. <laughs> so we are there. <laughs> but she's right. You are right. And I, and, and I know this man right here and a shout out to Kathy and him. They have been in this little Kathy over there is at every, almost every event I can think of. She's been trying to go to and inviting me to go. And this guy right here is always, hey, you want to go to school? You want to go to school? Kathy, wanna, finding whoever wants to go with them. So he's in the schools a lot. But I do think, um, yes, we do need to be in the schools more. It is hard because I know for me, I work a full, actually three jobs. He works a lot. Matt works full time. And so we do try to get in. And sometimes we're recommended not to get in while there's classes happening because they don't want it to disrupt the classes. So you do a lot of what? like when the school is out and going in and talking to teachers. But if you're suggesting that students want to see us, like what would you suggest, maybe lunchtime or something or? Um, probably a lunchtime. I just remembered that students were thinking it wasn't very fair that the board decided all of their decisions and they didn't really see them very much. Although I figured it was probably an error on both ends, like students not reaching out, but then it's probably hard for the board to get into schools. It was more of an idea of things I've heard from she think within the building. Okay. okay. Yeah. And we can, well, like I've been there, Ms. Hoover and I was there another couple of times at lunch and we did ask, we probably met with 50 kids, maybe, I mean, you know, that's not that many, but you know, I went to 10 different tables and asked questions about, you know, what's going on that's good, what's going on that's bad. And I wrote down, I had a list about this long from the middle school talking to students. Anyway, but yes, we can always do better, but thank you. And we're glad you're here. Yes. All right, um, Mr. Frank, board comments. Uh, uh, again, I just want to thank all the uh, teachers that are out there for, for everything you do. Uh, like I say, we couldn't do this without you. Uh, and I want to thank the teachers that are here tonight, uh, the ones that have left already, the CTE teachers and uh, the hardcore that are still here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Davis. I want to thank the teachers who have reached out via email concerning their concerns, healthcare, different things, because it was very uh, powerful, those emails that they sent to us. Um, the time they took to write those emails were, it took time and heart. And so I want them to know that those emails meant a lot to the board and, and a lot of the decision making that we made on the healthcare costs. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, don't, I guess that's my biggest, just a second. Yeah. Okay. If you think of something, let me know. Ms. Hoover. First, I want to thank all the high school students and CTE teachers that showed up tonight. I was really impressed with the amount of students that came out and, and represented and what great speakers they all are. And I wanted to congratulate all the county council, uh, Reflections winners, a um, lot of talent in the county, artistically especially. Um, and in addition to all the wonderful things that Dr. Boyd said about all the events that have been taking place in the last month, I attended some of those, but I also attended the kindergarten introduction um, this week, last week. And then there was a Title I event the, the night after that, and there was a huge turnout at both of those events and a lot of effort put into activities and one of them had free food and just really good things happening. Um, and I'm encouraged by that. And yes, Mr. Frank and I have been uh, trudging through elementary schools and speaking to teachers and trying to make a presence and the middle school is on our list. So what we were doing is talking to the, the students, the staff, and then making a second round. So we will get to you again. I hear you. Um, we, do, we do realize that we're making decisions for for people that we need to see and talk to. And I appreciate your feedback. Um, and I think that's all. Mr. Rawls. Yes, I just wanna thank uh, Pastor Davis for joining us tonight to do the invocation and also his words later for the public uh, comment. And um, so looking at CTE is amazing. We really, it's, it's great all the different things we offer for students and all the teachers that are involved in making that the great program that it is. We were doing well, you know, even before we got um, a, a CTE coordinator. And I was, that was budget season last year. That was my concern uh, that we didn't have money for that in there. And it's really great that we were able to find that later and get more, more money from the state. Cause I think Ms. Rinko used the, the word synergy a few times when she was talking and, and just seeing her be there, I think she's really energized the program and brought the synergy. And it's just, it's really just amazing to see and very excited about 
we're doing CTE. And very much like the um, their pilot acronym they're using for two, I saw the picture with them dressed up with their, their shirts and their aviator glasses on, very cool. Um, yeah, yeah, so just really glad to see what, what's going on there. And then, Alice, we decided on healthcare tonight, and I think we all just know how important healthcare is and really want the best benefits and compensation we can provide for our, our teachers. And I'll see it's a, um, so there's a tension with the, uh, the county that we, that we already take up half of, more than half the budget for the county. So the best thing we can do is to try to be as efficient with what we have to provide the most value to our employees that we can't have. So you could argue that, um, that um, just going ahead and increasing the funding there was, was kicking the can for the um, as far as taking care of health care, but um, that's not what really matters. I mean, it's not uh, what we pay for that is going to solve, make health care more efficient. It's it's now taking the initiative this year to uh, take some steps to look at options and maybe even consider some things beyond just traditional health insurance. I think I'm very willing as far as how we manage that program and, and the money that we have for it to uh, look at um, innovative ways to uh, help employees keep more of their own money so that it's benefits them as, as best as possible. So um, so it, it's only kicking the can out on the road is if uh, we come here next year and we haven't really made any changes to make things more efficient and then we're maybe trying to cover all the costs again. That's what that's when it be, becomes a concern. But as, I just trust that we'll work to not have that be the case and look forward to providing the best that we can. And that's, that's all I have. All right, go ahead, Ms. Davis. Um, really quick, so the CTE, that was so impressive. It really was sitting here. It made me proud to be a part of King George County Schools. And I don't wanna like pull anybody out, but Terry Rinko, every time that I hear her speak and see her passion, and all the other teachers that were out there, it just makes me want to be a better person. Makes me want to do better because she just makes everybody feel special and feel big. And so thank you for that. Also, I want to give a shout out to our student reps. Um, I, I know that one of your goals is to grow and be a better speaker. I think that's what you said at the one of the meetings. And you're doing great. And, and Connor, thank you for not being afraid to speak up for what you believe is right, because that's what you, you're supposed to do. And I appreciate the courage from both of you. Thank you. All right, thank you. I don't have um, basically everything I was going to say. Almost everybody already said it. I do want to, again, mention Ms. Renko and her um, work-based learning. My goodness, she is doing so much. Um, she is um, the energizer bunny, I guess. She's everywhere doing everything all the time. Um, and also for the CTE, Ms. Treslow and, of course, Ms. Hill, they're so involved in doing so, and it really was. I was impressed with all the all the students involved with so many things that were earning so many accolades at a student level that we haven't earned before, and that's very impressive. And that's because of people like Ms. Renko, Ms. Hill, and also it's even people like Ms. Higgins here and uh, getting information and communication out. And uh, I think um, that's part of all this is communication. And so I want to thank you and give a shout out to you. Um, did want to say also um, in response to, um, I know that um, uh, Connors and the, the whole cell phone thing, I'm sure that's the biggest conversation. My granddaughter and grandson are talking about it all the time. They're both in middle school. And so I hear about it all the time. Um, but I will say that um, we did have a cell phone committee and I don't know how many times did they meet Dr. Boyd? Uh, we met three times. Three times. How many students were on that committee? Uh, four or five different students. Four or five. Were you on that committee, Connor? No. Okay, so we did have some input from students, and they met several times. Uh, you know, Bush, we also had the ROTC, the NJROTC. Well, that's right. That's true. We had a whole debate in a classroom, uh, you know, and that was in the ROTC room, and that was wonderful too. In fact, that was very interesting. That was kind of right at the beginning of the whole cell phone discussion. Um, so we are getting, and that was probably what there were in the two classes, twenty students, thirty maybe, something like that. So the point is I'm making is we are getting input. I'm sure we can always use more. And so thank you for that. And uh, we are still, as you can tell tonight, we haven't made the decision yet. We are still in the midst of it. We wanna do something that will be beneficial, something that will work, um, because we do know there there's so much positive things about decreasing cell phone use, it's just hard to ignore. 
you know, grades go up, discipline gets better, you know, bullying gets better. It's, the list is quite long. It's the advantages when cell phone use goes down, those things get better. And that's just research. But um, it is very important that we do hear from those middle school and high school students about cell phone usage. And we may think of some other ways. Maybe they'll even in the midst of this, especially, you know, we're dealing with things at a policy level. And you guys need to understand that. Policy level means that we may say cell phone use is prohibited or under only certain circumstances, the administration makes decision about it. They decide how that would be done, whether, you know, it's at lunch or whether you can use it or, you know, you could use it on buses or not. That would be all at the level of the local administration. So a lot of this has to do with how it will be implemented. Our job is only policy. That's the 30,000 foot view. But the implementation of what it's going to look like will be done by Dr. Boyd and his administration. Does that make sense? So I want you guys, especially as being representatives on the board, to always realize that we're at the policy level. So a lot of things that you may see that are done in the schools may um, not have anything to do with the policy level. They're following it, but they're implementing it in different ways that doesn't have anything to do with what we decide. Does that make sense? All right. That's enough talking. <laughs> it's 10, it's 10, 12. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.